Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the 22nd meeting in 2017 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Uh, the usual story as far as our mobile phones are concerned, folks. Uh, the first item on our agenda is to take evidence on the outlook for the UK public finances from Paul Johnson, the Director of Institute for Fiscal Studies. And I welcome Paul to this meeting. I'm very grateful for him being here. Thank him for providing the slides that you've given us in advance of this session. I just wonder, Paul, if you want to make some any opening statement at this stage, any particular opening lines you'd like to give us? Uh, well, just very briefly to remind the committee to some extent of the background to the public finances. Obviously, we've had now uh, seven years of uh, pretty tight um, spending control following the financial crisis and the uh, very big deficit that we had back in 2010. The deficit is now down to less than 3% of national income, which um, is a you know, big uh, big change over the last uh, seven years, but that's clearly come at the cost of some you know, historically unprecedented uh, levels of uh, spending cuts across much of the public services. Um, looking forward, the expectation on current policy is that that deficit gets down to 1% of national income by the end of the decade against the Chancellor's self-imposed target of 2%. That looks like he's got a bit of wiggle room, uh, but um, we've also got an unprecedented level of uncertainty about what might happen to the economy over the next two or three years, given how little we know about the shape of any Brexit deal and how that might, um, and how that might play out. Uh, so the Chancellor's got quite a lot of difficult uh, decisions uh, to make at the moment, um, how much, if any, uh, used to make of his, um, his fiscal room for manoeuvre, how much to worry about the debt, which is now well over 80% of um, national income, how seriously is he taking his target to get to budget balance in the mid-2020s, um, and all against the background of very poor productivity performance and very, very low uh, increases in living standards, and indeed following recent inflation, probably probably falling living standards again um, over, this, uh, over this year. Uh, so uh, lo lots of issues on the spending and public um, finance side, and then uh, some issues on the tax side in particular. I'm sure the Chancellor would like to bring back his proposals to bring taxation of self-employment and employment more into line that he didn't get through in the last budget, but my guess is the parliamentary arithmetic will make that even more difficult than it was um, earlier in the year. Okay, thank you for that opening. Um, Murdo Fraser, you were going to ask some questions around borrowing OBR forecasts and fiscal policy, I think. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Mr Morning. Johnson, I can maybe just pick up the point you've just made about the Chancellor's wriggle room in terms of any policy choices he might make. The, the OBR's latest forecast, which is from March, um, uh, suggested that the Chancellor was on course to meet his borrowing target with some room to spare. Um, do you think the economic and fiscal outlook has changed in any way since March? And if so, what does that mean for the, the Chancellor's choices coming up to the budget? Um, my, my guess is that the um, economic outlook won't have changed very much in the views of the uh, of the OBR. The economic news this year hasn't been terribly different from uh, what might have been expected. I think the, um, I mean, I, I, as I said in my opening statement, I think the, the the overwhelming fact is the uncertainty actually about where we where the economy might go over the next three or four years. So whilst it looks like there's quite a lot of room for manoeuvre up to 2020, as the OBR also said, I can't remember the numbers, there's something like a, a, at least a one in three chance, even given that um, £20 billion pounds or so apparent room for manoeuvre, that on current policy we would still breach the 2% um, uh, target because the economy may well end up doing less well or tax receipts may well end up coming in um, less strongly than expected. And that's, you know, that, that probability is just based on historic um, mistakes uh, in forecasting. And as I said, I think you know, the chances are that the, un you know, the uncertainty in either direction is probably greater than normal this time round. So it may actually be a worse than, uh, you know, more than one in three chance that that will be breached because of the higher level of uncertainty. And I think that's um, you know, that, that's the balancing act that the Chancellor has, mm. to, has to do, how much weight to give to um, you know, strongly bad outcomes uh, in three or four years and how much weight to give to the central forecast. And if he gives a lot of weight to the central forecast, he may feel he's got more room for manoeuvre than if he's putting a lot of weight on the, um, on, on, on the uncertainty. Okay, so, so in light of what you've said, how likely do you think 
it is that the Chancellor and the Budget will announce some loosening of fiscal policy, or do you think you'll just want to keep the ship sailing in the same direction? Well, I wouldn't want to put a probability on it, but I mean, I think the things he's weighing up are, uh, I mean, on, on the one side, as I said, the um, uncertainty um, and the need potentially just to keep some fiscal <coughs> firepower back for what may turn out to be some bad news around, you know, whatever the Brexit deal turns out to be. Um, on the other hand, um, he's got this apparent room for manoeuvre and there are clear uh, pressures on, on public services. So a couple of years ago, you, I think you could reasonably have said that all of that public spending um, uh, cuts hadn't really started pushing through into very obvious problems with, uh, with public services. It's much harder to make that case now. So if you remember back last um, autumn, the Chancellor found more money for prisons because there was clearly a big issue in terms of uh, what was happening in prisons at the time. Uh, back in March, he found more money, partly through increased council tax for social care, um, in England. Uh, you know, this time round, it's pretty clear that um, social care is still an issue, uh, that uh, waiting lists and so on in the National Health Service are uh, growing. Local government is beginning to um, show significant signs of strain. And of course, we've got big cuts in welfare benefits just starting, uh, really. So there's quite a lot of pressure on him also to, to find a bit of money for those public services and it's that balance between um, leaving himself some room for manoeuvre later on and responding to some of those pressures including the public pay pressures uh, that he's going to have to that he's going to have to take my guess is um, you know, if it's going to move anywhere it'll move towards a loosening but how big a loosening I don't know okay all right thank you Willie Coffey can you could I just talk about this potential room for manoeuvre uh, in your paper, you speculate that there could be a further three and a half billion pounds budget cut by the, the UK government. So, does this room for manoeuvre assume that that's going to take place, or that might not happen? Uh, well, the I mean, there are a set of spending plans laid out in the um, in the budget, um, and that includes uh, some. Uh, some significant increases in investment spending and then relative to national income at least uh, some some pretty significant reductions in day to day spending um, and that's where you know when the, the plans are to get from a two percent or nearly three percent deficit to a one percent deficit that is a tightening that's a, a a fall in the size of um, the state in intervention over that time uh, the um, uh, and this goes back to the choice we were just just describing. The Chancellor could decide that actually he's happy with the deficit roughly where it is at two and a half, three percent of national income. That gives him a lot of room for manoeuvre, and the debt could probably bear a few years of two and a half, three percent um, deficits. That that would be a very different path to the path that he's currently planning, which is to get down to uh, get down get down to one percent, and that's the big choice that he's going to have to make. What do you think? I mean, what, what would be the, the proportion of that three and a half billion pounds cut that might impact on the Scottish budget? Would you, would you think? Uh, I, I, I'm afraid I, I, I don't know exactly what the Barnet consequentials of that, um, of that will be. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. The, the OBR also said that even though the economy has been poor for ten years, there's no capacity on it to expand, uh, and then what they, they also said is that that means that they can't rely on above normal levels of growth to help bring the deficit down further. Does that just kind of point us and edges more towards more cuts being the only solution to bring us back into line? Yeah, I mean, that's the, you know, in a sense, that's the most, um, you know, that's a desperately depressing conclusion that the OBR have, have drawn. We've had, um, you know, seven years of very poor growth um, in terms of national income per head. We're barely uh, above where we were back in 2008. So we've had a decade with no growth, essentially, in national income per head. Uh, and the economy is, the UK economy, is something like £300 billion smaller than we might reasonably have expected back in 2008 on the basis of historic trends. And yet the OBR judges that there's no, um, there's, that, 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 that there's no room for uh, growth because we are basically at the new trend. Um, so if, you, if, if, if the OBR is right, then that means that, for example, there's, there's little scope for a fiscal expansion in a kind of Keynesian sense driving additional growth because we're already at um, capacity if they're, um, if they're correct. It also means 
that in the long run additional spending will have to be paid for through additional tax because um, because if again if they're right in the long run there's no scope for above above trend growth so that that's a very different place um, from one where we might have been a few years ago where we had a big deficit um, poor growth and at least a, you know a general acceptance that the economy wasn't um, at trend being at trend if it's right is a, it creates a much bigger constraint on on, on government yeah. thank you yeah. Uh, I mean, can I just ask you if you think the OBR are right about that? I mean, you, you, you caveated all of that by saying if the, if the OBR are right, if the OBR, I mean, what, what's your professional judgment as to whether the OBR are, are, are correct about these assumptions that they're making? Um, I mean, I, I, I mean, this is an incredibly difficult judgment. I mean, the Bank of England is in a reasonably um, similar place. There is quite a wide range of views among the macro forecasting community, of which I am not a part, happily. Um, uh, I mean, the, you know, if, if you look at um, particularly employment levels, which is one of the key key inputs into the OBR uh, OBR calculations, then it you know it, it's hard to believe that there's a lot of scope for additional employment. Um, we're at high, record levels of uh, of employment. Um, the flip side of that is that we've got very We've had very poor levels of productivity and earnings growth, um, but there seems to be no. I mean, that, and that's part of the judgment that all of that up till now has just been lost. That there's no additional scope for that. And that's partly because investment has not been terribly strong um, in, in in recent years, which reduces the uh, capacity for that. It's also actually in the OBR numbers. Um, uh, it's partly down to immigration, and if immigration. Uh, falls off a bit, then that also reduces scope for, um, uh, for for economic growth across the economy. So I don't know whether they're dead right. Um, it may be that there's a, a little bit of spare capacity, but I don't think there's many people who believe there's a lot of spare capacity out there which would allow big differences in terms of judgments. Can I ask you a couple of supplementaries to that as well? You just mentioned the migration issue, obviously, and obviously the discussions that are going around Brexit as far as that particular component in EU nationals are, are concerned. Do you like to expand a bit more about that in terms of the room in the economy for growth um, with the challenge we're now going to have in terms of the number of people who are you know, going to be able, uh, uh, going to be uh, around as a pool for us, effectively, from EU nationals? Well, I think there's, I mean, there's a number of parts of this. I mean, first, there, there's, again, a lot of uncertainty about what this might do to levels of immigration. Now, the um, judgment that the OBR has taken is that there'll be a significant fall uh, in net uh, migration and that that will actually hit the public finances reasonably hard. I mean, their view is that uh, tax revenues will be about six billion down relative to what they otherwise would have been. And if, in addition, um, government gets to its stated target of getting net migration down to below 100,000, then that's an additional six billion hit. Uh, to the public finances through lower um, through lower tax revenues. Uh, the, 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 the unknown here is the scale of potential return movement by uh, European workers. Now, clearly the UK economy just looks very different to what it would have looked like had we not had this net influx of something like 2 million um, European workers over the last decade and a half. If, 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 so, so it's important to get two things, to distinguish two things. One is that net immigration may go down, and that will have a relatively gradual effect on the economy. Another possibility is large numbers of people might decide to leave, and you may actually get a net emigration, at least of some classes of workers and some classes of nationalities, and that would make you know, certain parts of the economy very difficult to. Um, very difficult to maintain, and may, you know, in the longer run, change the structure of the um, structure of the economy. I think it brought that alive to me this week. I was talking to a construction company in one constituency, who are already, you know, beginning to see some hemorrhaging of people go leaving um, the, the United Kingdom, and are taking quite rightly aggressive approaches around potential um, recruitment of apprentices for the future, just to ensure themselves. So if they're doing that in the, in the construction industry and all the other construction industry people are reacting in the same way uh, and they're out there 
quite rightly, from their perspective, aggressively trying to find different types of recruitment in, it might leave some of the public sector a bit more vulnerable because it's not going to respond in that way because it just won't because it's the nature of the beast to try to, to begin to look at where they're going to get their people to work in the public sector in future. And that did that balance about how the private sector is now responding against the public sector did worry me when I heard that. When they, and I'm not criticising them because they're doing the right thing mm -hmm. for themselves. Mm -hmm. Do you think mm -hmm. there's a potential problem there just in terms of the balance of the economy and people enough people to be able to work in these areas in future? Well, I mean, I think there are different, I mean, again, there are different parts of the economy. There are some you know, bits of agriculture, for example, where uh, historically the UK is dependent on, on, on migrant labour to do uh, quite a large fraction of the, of the work. Now, in, in a world in which that labour is simply not available, my guess is that some of that business will just stop, um, you know, if you, if, if you can't get people to pick your strawberries or what have you at an appropriate uh, wage, then you know we will have made a decision that it's better that our economy doesn't support that kind of work. Um, it's interesting what you say about um, the, taking on apprentices and so on in the construction industry. One of the things that um, one of the things is very it's very hard to find any economic research which suggests that it's had that, that net, net migration has had that kind of impact in terms of reducing uh, opportunities for. Um, uh, training and higher wages among native, uh, the native-born, but it, it, the, the way in which a lot of that research is done makes it quite difficult to be confident about that when you've had such a big change over such a prolonged period. So it is possible, at least, that uh, you know, one of the effects of this will be to increase training opportunities available to, um, you know, to, uh, to, 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 to British-born uh, workers. As I say, the economic research doesn't show that, but it seems to me at least possible, whilst on, you know, on the other hand it is very clear that it won't increase the total uh, number of jobs um, available. As far as the public sector is concerned, there are clearly um, you know, hot spots, as it were, there. You know, um, nurses in London and the South East, for example, is it got a very high fraction of European um, and uh, foreign-born um, staff. It's clear that already uh, there's, there's been an effect um, has been an effect there, and it takes quite a long time to train some of these uh, some of these groups. That said, again, you know, there is an over demand still, despite the end of the nursing bursary. There is still an over demand for um, places at universities to train um, in this in this kind of way. But it will cost us more to um, you know, to train more. Okay, Ivan, you got a supplementary in this yeah, area as well. So Come on. Um, Thanks, Convener, and explore a bit more around about the immigration numbers, uh, Paul, if, if that's OK. Um, it's interesting to hear what you said there, the six billion already baked in. What assumption does that place on where net immigration would be? Do you know that number? Uh, I, don't know the, I, I don't know the number. That, that's the difference. I mean, that's based on the difference between the numbers coming in over the next three or four years right. relative to what they have uh, the OBR would have expected had we not had the Brexit vote. I, I, I'm right, afraid okay. I don't have numbers, in my head the precise numbers. But so the numbers that have been, I mean, what, 300,000, I think? Gross. I mean, up to now. Yeah. 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 OK. And then I've seen there's another six billion hit to the tax take if it drops below 100,000. Yes. Right, OK, so, there are, so that number somewhere between 100,000 and 300,000 then, that, 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 that they're assuming going forward. Um, in terms of the net emigration, I mean, certainly my own anecdotal experience talking to Eastern Europeans here and, and in Eastern Europe is that there's quite a large potential for that, accelerated also by the exchange rate situation, which makes it far mm, less attractive mm, mm. for people to be working here and sending mm. money home if they can earn more in uh, working in, um, in one of the other EU countries. Um, but that hasn't been factored in at all. And I think there was some data recently that suggested that in terms of Eastern European, we were actually starting to move towards an immigration situation. If you get any assessment of where we would be if, if there was a further hit then to, to the immigration in terms of we started to see a significant net immigration to back to Eastern Europe? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I think to some extent, I mean, I mean, I mean you're exactly right about what might happen and what's driving it and the you know the thing that will make the hundred thousand or less target attainable is that we just make ourselves very unattractive to people to you know, come and live and work yeah. here where yeah. it is, irrespective of any policies that mm -hmm. we pursue and it may be that there is some tipping point at which this you know, starts to change very 
quickly. Now, I don't think we're, you know, we're not there yet, and we're still looking at a position of significant net immigration. Um, uh, but, you know, if, 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 if we're losing six billion now, and we'd lost another six billion if we got below 100,000, then clearly if we got to a net emigration point, then we'd be losing, you know, at least that much, yeah. um, at least that much again in yeah. terms of uh, in terms of tax okay. receipts. And it's also important to think about the composition of this. And I mean, the, these net numbers can be quite misleading because if, um, you know, clearly the net number might not go down so much if, um, if, if given uncertainty about their rights. We get a lot of British pensioners, for example, who are currently living in um, yeah. you, uh, the rest of Europe coming back. The net number might not uh, go down so much, but clearly we'll be swapping, as it were, um, working age um, people paying tax for pension age people who are in receipt of benefits. Yeah, OK. Now that's, that's clear. Um, and when you talk about those numbers, put it in context, six billion, another six billion, maybe another six billion, that starts to have a material impact on the deficit and the debt as a percentage of GDP. Because I think you're about 15 billion is probably close to 1% or thereabouts, is it? Yeah, about 18 billion 18 is about 1%. Billion, yeah. Okay. So that so begins to have a, yeah, I mean, that does begin to have a significant um, impact. And again, actually, if you look back at previous um, OBR reports, you'll mm -hmm. see one of the things which has helped the public finances in the past has been that immigration has come in uh, above their previous expectations. It's one of the things that's kind of dug the Chancellor out of a, a hole okay. once or twice uh, over the last six or seven um, over the last six or seven years. So yes, it does add up a matter. It is worth saying on the other side of this, we're looking at the sort of, you know, the gross impact on tax receipts as a, a, as a whole. Clearly there are local areas where the impact on public services goes in the other direction, yeah. that, uh, you know, the impact on local health or education services. Now that tends to be very concentrated, whereas the, 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 the tax receipts are sort of beneficial across the piece and one of the things that I think arguably particularly the way with local the way in which local government has been funded in England over the last seven or eight years has not compensated adequately for increased population when that's come about. Okay and um, I mean clearly there's a different scenario in Scotland where we're much closer to our net immigration number has traditionally been lower anyway so this would have a, a much bigger impact potentially in Scotland as well. In, in terms of the growth rate is there any assessment for those reduced immigration numbers across the UK would have on the UK's growth rate? Um, I mean, to, a, to a first approximation, the evidence suggests it wouldn't have any effect on growth rate per capita. So the, course, you know, yeah. the, um, it's, it, 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 the evidence is not particularly that having more immigration has a big impact on the growth rate per person. Uh, but on the overall growth rate, it would be essentially proportional to the uh, to the pop, uh, to the population. Okay. So if you've got the population one percent smaller, then the economy would would itself be one percent smaller. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. I yep. just want some clarity around the, the six billion figure. Yeah. Thank you. I, I know it's not your figure. Um, it's the OBR's figure. But can you just? I mean, this six billion figure this is an annual figure. So it's a loss to the economy of six billion pounds every year. It's a loss to tax revenues right. of six billion pounds a year by I think 2020 or 2021. So it's a cumulative effect of a smaller number of people. So if fewer people come in this year, next year, the year after, and the year after. Uh, the calculation is that the uh, Q, that, that, that in 2021 the revenue coming to the exchequer will be six billion less okay. than it would have been had net immigration continued at its previous level. Okay, thanks. But it's a figure, as you just said, I think in response to Mr. McKee, that it, it's, a, it's a figure that talks only about loss of. Uh, revenues. It doesn't take into account re reduced expenditure in public services in areas where you have, you know, quite dense immigration. Yeah, that, 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 that's correct. Is there, that, is, is there a kind of figure that puts those those two things together so that we have a, a complete picture rather than just one side of the? Um, coin the, the, the uh, well, I mean, there's two there's two ways of answering that. What one is that, as I say, um, the public find, the, the public spending hasn't tended to reflect the increase in the number of um, people. So there isn't a direct one to one correlation there. And I think that's probably been one of the problems that actually the way that local government in England particularly has been financed has not reflected increases in number of people. Right. Uh, so that would leave spending per person higher than it otherwise um, would have done. Whether it has much effect on total spending uh, I think is more questionable. So for example, um, benefit spending, which is clearly very directly linked to individuals, is very, very low on um, uh, on 
on immigrants. Um, there's clearly more spending on um, on health and education. It's it's a fra it's it's some fraction of the six billion. It's less than six billion, but it's it's, it's probably a couple of billion. But that's a, that that that's a bit of a guess. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. F forget the for, sorry. For, forgive this brain for needing a wee bit more information on this six billion figure. I, I, I'm, I'm assuming it will go something like till 2021, four billion, five billion, six billion over the financial years. It won't be these exact numbers, but after 2021, it will stick. It, it might potentially go up or down from that six billion well, figure. Re re I mean, it's, it's always against a counterfactual, and I, and, and I suppose one of the issues is whether it is reasonable to think there is a counterfactual in which net immigration continues at the very high levels that it has been um, in the past. Uh, so, you know, if the counterfactual is that we had net immigration of 300,000 a year ad infinitum, um, then you might you might reasonably ask whether that's actually a sensible counterfactual and whether it would have to have sort of tailed off tailed in any off. case. Okay. Um, Marie. Uh, thank you, convener. I wanted to ask, I mean, I know there's a general challenge on the public purse because of inflation, but is there a specific challenge because of the uh, sterling crash? So anecdotally, I'm told that see where the NHS goes to buy an MRI scanner, it's often in a different currency. So is there a specific impact on the, of what's happened with the currency on some of our public um, spending? Um, I, I'm afraid I don't know the details of uh, NHS spending in, 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 in that sense, but clearly um, where you're buying big things from uh, foreign providers, and I think the Ministry of Defence does quite a lot of that, um, uh, that's going to have a big impact on the prices that you are paying, as well as, of course, the need to, you know, I suspect the biggest impact is on public sector workers, where, you know, a 1% cap might be manageable if inflation's at one, one or two percent, but if inflation's at three or four percent because of the um, uh, devaluation, uh, then uh, th then that's an even harder thing to manage. And because we spend 180 billion pounds a year on public sector pay, an extra one or two percent on that probably dwarfs any um, any of the other impacts. Okay, thank you. Um, Ash, given that we're on external factors mm -hmm. and, and you wanted issues about the single market, and we'll, I think we'll come to you next then, and because Paul's introduced this already, the public sector PSU will come to Neil after that. Okay, thank you. Morning. Um, I was... I saw your Twitter, and yeah, I'll just read the tweet out to you. Um, stunned, both main parties support leaving the single market. This guarantees to make living standards worse. Would you like to expand on that, Annie? I'm sure I didn't tweet stunned. So, you know, if 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 you're um, if you leave the single market, um, uh, that will, I mean that will clearly uh, reduce living standards relative to the world in which you stay in it, and it's a you know in a sense it's a very simple proposition. The um, European Union is by far our biggest, closest and richest trading partner. We do about half of our trade with them. And if we make that trade more expensive, that will on average um, make us, uh, that will on average make us worse off. I mean, that, uh, the, I mean, the, the, the single market is particularly important for the services um, industries because it is through the single market that uh, they have pretty free access to the rest of um, the EU. And very few free trade agreements, if any, um, provide anything like the kind of integration that the single market gives for um, for service industries. Uh, clearly, the customs union is the thing that's crucial for um, uh, more more crucial for manufacturing, where it's border checks that, uh, that and, and non-tariff barriers that create uh, the the biggest issue. So again, if you make that trade more difficult, um, you will you will make us worse off. Now, part of what the sterling depreciation was about was about an expectation that um, this will become more difficult, that UK goods and services abroad will become more expensive, and therefore, um, and, and therefore sterling depreciates in expectation of that. My guess is if, um, if this became, if we ended up with a, a bad trade deal, then sterling would go down again, in, uh, partly in compensation for uh, for that expectation, and as we know, the first impact of that is to increase prices, and that's just making us worse off. 
So what impact do you think leaving the single market and possibly the customers union as well would have on the public finances, either for the UK and then the knock-on effect on, the, on Scotland? Uh, well, the, um, I mean, the, the, the public finance impact, the, um, uh, the, the OBR has made some fairly modest assumptions about the impact of, um, uh, of leaving the EU on, on the economy and their, therefore the public finances. I mean, it's one thing, I, um, I've got the number there somewhere, but it, it, it makes a difference of something like 20 billion, I think, to the public finances in the early um, 20 uh, 2020s on that basis for the UK, to Scotland. For the UK. Right. Um, uh, and the, the big question the, the real big question well, sorry, let, let, let me let me let me let me take this in three chunks um, so the first thing is that in terms of the public finances we um, uh, we, we spend uh, gross uh, about 15 billion on EU membership that's about 8 billion net uh, and one of the things actually in the public finance numbers is that 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 eight that that that, that 8 billion difference so the 8 billion um, net that we spend hasn't been allocated. So actually, in that sense, there is an extra, relative to the current baseline, there's an extra eight billion to spend. But uh, the OBR numbers um, are suggesting a, a loss, to, an overall loss to the public finances because of lower growth. So there's not an extra, eight, it's a relative to the sort of status quo ante, um, there is a sort of a, something like minus eight billion to spend. I can't remember the precise numbers, I'm afraid. Um, uh, and, and, but the there is then, secondly, the question of the so-called divorce settlement. Now, uh, I don't know what number that will be, but it sounds like it will be somewhere between 20 and 50 billion. Now, in a sense, that's, I mean, obviously 20 or 50 billion is a big number, but one should think of it as a one-off number, which will increase the debt, but not increase the deficit in each year going forward. And in that sense, it's a much smaller number than... 10 billion a year, obviously. I mean, 10 billion a year kind of accumulates to an awful lot over a period. And then the third, the third question is not just what the public finance will, impact will be in year one. Um, it's uh, really what is the impact on economic growth in the UK each year um, going forward. And then even, even if it has effect of only 0.1% a year, that dwarfs all of the other numbers because within 20 years that adds up to a very large number. And if you look at some of the work that's been done at the London School of Economics and the University of Warwick, their view is that um, the size of the UK economy would be between 5 and 10% smaller um, after 20 or 30 years than it would have been had we stayed um, in the single market and so on. And an economy that's 5 or 10% smaller is, is much poorer in terms of its capacity to uh, manage the public finances. So just briefly to go back to living standards, you know, you've said it's guaranteed to make living standards worse. Would you be able to put a percentage on that? You've just said the economy could be 5 to 10% smaller. Could you then apply that to living standards? Could they be 5 to 10% worse? Uh, well, if that's the effect on the economy, then that would be the effect on average on, on, on living standards. Now, there is, you know, whilst I think there is genuinely no uncertainty about the direction of the impact, um, the scale of the impact is very difficult to, um, uh, to know. Neil? Yeah, just the, in terms of um, the public sector pay cap, in, in Scotland there's a higher percentage of public sector workers than the rest of the UK. It's around 21% in Scotland, 17% uh, across the whole of the UK. If the UK government was to relax the pay cap, what would be the impact in terms of UK departmental spend and then the knock-on impact in terms of the Scottish budget and would it be fair to say that lifting the pay cap across the UK would disproportionately benefit Scotland and the Scottish budget because of the um, the higher sector, public sector workers that there are in Scotland? Uh, I think the big, the, big, the big question here for the government and the Chancellor is um, what he means by lifting the public yeah. pay cap. So you could, as we've seen with... Um, uh, two recent announcements on uh, police and prison officers, you could say, look, we're going to pay them more, uh, but without giving the services any more money. And that, um, uh, you know, that, that in then, you know, it obviously doesn't flow across into the Scottish budget at all, mm. um, because there's the same amount of money um, going in. So you could imagine the Chancellor saying in the budget uh, that he's no longer going to ask uh, pay review bodies to keep within a 1% cap and he'll take note of their uh, recommendations. Um, now it's very interesting looking at the NHS pay review body uh, this year. 
um, with the 1% pay cap. And they say in their introduction, um, because they have to take account of all of the pressures on the NHS and how much pay should rise in the context of all the other pressures, they say very, very starkly in the introductory part of what they say, we thought very hard about recommending zero um, because... Uh, in their judgment, it was pretty finely balanced whether that um, you know, billion and a half pounds or whatever the 1% pay cost, in their judgment, very finely judged as whether extra pay was the best way of spending that. So it's quite possible that the Chancellor would say, we'll get rid of the pay cap, we're not going to give any more money, and then the NHS pay review body, for example, will come back with 1% um, anyway. Um, now, uh, and, and, and as I say, in, 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 in that context, it doesn't have any impact on the Scottish budget. Now, it's, it's also possible that the Chancellor will um, say, we, we want to get rid of this 1% pay cut, and as a result, we'll give a certain amount of money to each of the key departments who are responsible for these services, um, and then the pay review bodies need to take a judgment as to how much of that to uh, spend on pay, and if there's more money for the services, then that clearly has a knock-on effect on Scotland. I mean, the last thing I'd say on this is I mean, clearly there are significant differences by region and by, you know, what kind of worker they are in the public sector. But if you look, put the whole lot together, um, it's not just the politics that are pushing for um, higher pay now. We've actually... Ha we We've got pay in the public sector now, which is about back where it was in 2008 relative mm. to pay in the private sector. So if you carry on with that 1% mm -hmm. pay limit, then pay in the public sector quite rapidly falls relative to pay in the private sector to historically quite low <coughs> levels. So I think we're probably going to have to do something about public sector pay, certainly within the next mm. couple um, of years. Uh, but but that, that point about it, public pay now being about where it was in relative to private pay in 2008 is quite important because we tend to talk about these things separately. We talk about living standards having done and earnings having done really badly and then completely separately we talk about public pay having done really badly. Actually, public sector workers and private sector workers have gone in lockstep pretty much since um, you know, they've gone different, got, got, got there in a different way, but public sector workers have not done any worse than private sector workers over that period on average. In the short term, you're saying there might not be a, a disproportionate impact on the, on, on the Scottish budget. In the longer term, due to the higher number of public sector workers in Scotland and the fact that raising revenues in Scotland is now vital to, to the Scottish budget and economic growth, um, would you accept in the longer term that a public sector pay cap would, would, um, being lifted would help the Scottish economy and the Scottish budget? Uh, well, I mean, it, it, it depends how you fund it, but clearly... Um, if, if it results in more Barnet consequentials coming to Scotland because more money is being spent in England, then that is, you know, that's clearly helpful to uh, that's clearly helpful to the Scottish uh, budget. Um, the fact that you have a higher fraction uh, means, that, though, that um, the knock-on effect would pr probably be higher than the Barnet consequential would necessarily um, fund. Um, but clearly, it's a more important part of the, as you say, if it's a higher fraction of the Scottish workforce, then it's a more important part of the Scottish economy. Can I um, just... Obviously, the public sector pay cap will cost money. I note in your, your evidence you, you say, um, to give one example, that the government could choose not to implement the planned cut to corporation tax, which would save mm -hmm. around £5 mm -hmm. billion. Pounds. Mm -hmm. Given that the, the pressures that there are to increase mm -hmm. public sector pay, and that £5 billion pounds is a huge amount of money to be mm -hmm. cutting mm -hmm. in corporation tax, how likely do you think it would be that we would see corporation tax being cut and public sector pay cap not being lifted? I wouldn't want to put probabilities on it, but I think if, um, you know, if I was the Chancellor uh, looking at the um, difficulties I've got at the moment, knowing that the parliamentary arithmetic, frankly, makes most tax rises quite difficult, um, and I was looking for some additional money, then not implementing something, um, which is in, currently in the plans, looks a lot easier uh, than, than, than raising something. I mean, the problem is that that, I mean, that corporation tax cut is legislated, so you'd have to legislate not to um, bring it in. I don't know whether he'll do it, but it seems to me he, he's bound to be considering it. Um, uh, and as you say, part of the trade-off there is if you get that extra five billion in, then that, that helps with things like public pay or whatever else mm. the other um, priorities, uh, priorities might be. The reason he might not 
do the you know reverse the corporation tax cut is um, precisely to do with um, uh, issues around Brexit, which is you know we know already that uh, the uncertainty around Brexit is reducing um, uh, the long-term investment that some big companies are doing, uh, and whilst small cuts in corporation tax don't have big impacts on these things they might be seen uh, as, as a signal supporting that. So again, it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's not a straightforward choice. But, but sorry to repeat, if I, were, if, if I were the Chancellor and I did want an extra five billion of revenue, that would be pretty close to the top of my list. Okay. Just on the public sector pay, and I'll come to you in a minute, Patrick. You, you've said put some very strong things that are in the public sector pay, Paul, in the past. I think last November you said, I'm sorry, on pay levels generally, <coughs> one cannot see how extraordinary uh, dreadful this is, and I think yesterday, if I've got this right, and people are giving me the right briefing here, and I hope, I, I hope I've got this right, that the, we've now got the, loge, the lowest wage growth since the 1750s. Mark Carney there, yes. It was Mark Carney that said that, well, cause that's, because then, then what concerns me is the cumulative impact between the stuff you're talking about with Ash and the single market, and the impact on living standards, together with that low, low wage growth, the cumulative impact on people's standard of living. Um, I don't know if you'd like to say a bit more about that. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, yes. I mean, the, it, it has been. Uh, I mean, it has been an extraordinary decade in all sorts of ways. So, um, average earnings today are still below where they were in 2008, which is just astonishing. Um, uh, it's, you know, people people dispute whether it's since the 1750s, the 1800s, or the 1850s, the last time we had a decade this bad. But 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 certainly, certainly for a very very long time in terms of um, in, in terms of earnings. Now, in terms of living standards, um, I mean, well, uh, and, and, uh, in terms of earnings, it's particularly been younger people who have uh, been hit worst. So people in their 20s, so earnings of people in their 20s are still significantly below the earnings of people in their 20s. In 2008, whereas um, earnings for older workers have generally uh, recovered, um, the when we had a period in 2014, 2015, in which real earnings were beginning to rise again, um, but uh, the spike in inflation we've had this year means that over the last year, real earnings have started falling again, and that's um, as we've discussed directly down to the uh, fall in sterling. Now, going forward. Um, uh, we hope uh, that earnings will start to rise again, but given um, the discussion about the economic uncertainties around Brexit, they're presumably going to rise less quickly than they would have done in a, in a different world in which we weren't leaving um, the European Union. But that, you know, that does mean a long view. The OBR's projection is that <coughs> average earnings in 2020 will still be below uh, where they were in, um, in in 2008, and that's something that was, in their judgment, that was something that tipped. I mean, in a sense, it doesn't really matter. It's just a statistical artifact, but that was something that tipped after the referendum. So they thought in 2015, in uh, before the referendum in March 2016, the earnings by 2020 would have got above their 2008 level, and then after the referendum, they thought they wouldn't by 2020 get to above their 2008 level. Patrick. Just wanted to explore some of the figures that you've um, given us on uh, public sector pay, and I'm, I'm glad that your, your comments just uh, in those last few moments uh, recognise that there's a difference between people's real experience and what the average is. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the level of inequality is something that we're, uh, I hope, all very concerned about rather than just the, the average. Um, you've um, suggested that increasing uh, average public sector pay in line with prices or private sector earnings would increase the cost of employing the 5.1 million public sector workers by around 6 billion per year by 1920. Um, I'm assuming that those figures are based on uh, UK-wide full public sector, not just those directly employed by the UK government and, and subject to pay negotiations on, on that direct basis. You're talking about all of the other public sector bodies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, has that figure taken account of uh, the additional income tax that would be paid or other indirect effects? In other words, is that a, a measure of the affordability yeah, yeah. or is it just about the pay bill itself? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, the, uh, the, the answer is yes, we've tried to take account of the effect of 
income tax, national insurance, and pension contributions. Uh, so the gross number is about nine billion, and you know that's a number we'd be quite confident of. The net number is actually quite a lot more difficult to calculate, which is why I think I use words like around, mm -hmm. um, but it's around that six billion, and that's the affordability across the public sector number, and that, that that's really important from the point of view of, of any individual, um, uh, any individual department. So the uh, so the health service, for example, will feel the gross cost, whereas the treasury will feel the net cost. Mm. And it, it relates to, to Neil's point, I, th I think, as well, about the uh, the size of the public sector in Scotland relative uh, to, to the UK as a whole, if more of that uh, income tax revenue is being uh, generated in Scotland, then that has a, a potential uh, effect on the, uh, the block grant adjustment mechanism. Uh, yes, because, yes, I mean, that, that will, I mean, you'll, yeah. it, it'll ensure that income tax revenue in Scotland rises possibly a little bit faster than that in the yeah. rest of the UK. Not massively, but it could a be. Little it bit. Could be. On the other hand, it will be the UK Treasury which gets your the higher national insurance contributions, yeah. for example. There'll be other indirect effects like uh, potentially reduced demand for social security payments of one kind or another, potentially reduced demand uh, on the health service, for example, if we're talking about public sector workers, many of whom uh, are low earners, reducing the, the direct amount of poverty uh, that many of those are in uh, will have a, a, a positive effect uh, in, in other areas of public services. Has that been taken account of? Those more indirect, you know, one step removed again from the from the direct pay bill? No, we can't take account of that. Though I think it's um, it, it is important. I mean, whilst clearly there are low-paid public sector workers and there are those who are, are on benefits. About two thirds of public sector workers are graduates. I mean, they're much, much. I mean, public sector workers. The average pay of public sector workers is actually much higher than private sector workers because they are so, so much a graduate, um, high skilled workforce. And actually, among the lowest paid public sector workers, so the the least skilled public sector workers are the ones who command the biggest premium over the private sector. So, uh, actually, the the, the 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 real problem about poverty pay. Mm. Is a private sector problem much more than it's a public sector problem. Sure. Just uh, finally, in in the Scottish government's response to whatever the the UK government does uh, in its in its budget, uh, is the Scottish government in a position to easily calculate the total cumulative affordability uh, of increasing public sector pay at or above inflation, taking into account yes the direct effect on the pay bill. Uh, to, the, to itself and other public sector bodies that it funds, but also the, the knock-on effects on taxation, uh, on devolved elements of, of social security or other public services. Is that a, 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 an achievable calculation? It ought to be, yes. And uh, is anybody other than the government in a position to do it? Can it be done based on what is in the public domain already? Uh, you'd probably best ask the people behind me. But, um, uh, it, it may well be that Fraser Allender or David Bell or okay. somebody can do that, I don't know. Thank you. Alexander? Uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, good morning. Uh, so I've changed the direction of uh, your Chancellor for a day type question. Um, you've written a lot, <laughs> written at length about how you'd improve the UK uh, tax system to be more uh, efficient and effective. Uh, given you're up here, uh, could I ask you to maybe put yourself in the finance secretary's shoes uh, and see, uh, are there any obvious suggestions uh, for how the system up here could be similarly improved? Um, uh, but bearing in mind, you'd have to go and get cross-party support for any observations. <laughs> <laughs> We, I mean, you're, you're, I mean, you're, um, I mean, you've obviously got also a lot more uh, constraints uh, on, on what you're able to do. So a, a lot of the big problems with the UK system sit with capital taxation, which I don't think you can change, um, with uh, national insurance contributions, which again I don't think you can change, and with the VAT system, which again I don't think you can change. So actually, in terms of structural issues, um, uh, many of them are not within your purview. Uh, and certainly, the biggest, many of the biggest ones, are not within your um, within your purview. I mean, within those that are, um, the um, taxation of housing uh, remains a uh, a huge issue across uh, across the UK. Um, and I mean, our view is that there's a strong case of rebalancing away from what in uh, England is stamp duty, and here is the land. 
MTT. Oh, yes, that one. Um, uh, rebalancing away from that towards council tax. And I know that you've had council tax frozen for a long time um, here. Uh, there's a strong economic argument actually for um, having uh, council tax, which is a closer reflection of the actual value of properties um, or the relative value rather than you know, being regressive in the um, size of the uh, in, in the value of the property and based on uh, very out of date um, valuation. So one thing that I might do is um, reduce uh, the uh, transaction tax and reform and increase um, the council tax. Now that will help both with um, the, the functioning of the market. Um, it would help actually with one of the inequalities that we haven't talked about, which is that between generations where um, you know, the current system benefits those who are uh, currently um, owning um, expensive properties and uh, is a problem for those wanting to get onto the housing market. So the tax system actually makes that worse. So I, I mean, I think there are definitely things within the uh, taxation of housing which are, uh, which, are uh, which you can do. Um, now you've obviously also got some choice over the income tax um, system. Uh, actually, the, 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 there's not much structural that you can change there because a lot of the problems are about the way that the income tax system treats earnings relative to um, capital income, and that, as I understand, is not something that you can shift. Uh, I mean, so the one thing that you could do, which you may or may not decide to do, I, I guess, is um, you move away from this rather silly, um, whatever it is, 60 odd percent rate on earnings between 100 and 120,000 uh, that we have under the current um, uh, current income tax system. Thank you. When you say move away, could you t expand what you mean by that? Uh, well, so. Uh, at, at the moment, um, as you know, the personal allowance is um, so-called tapered away for people earning between 100 and 120 something um, thousand a year, and that creates uh, a 60, including national insurance, a 62% um, marginal tax rate on people in that um, in that region. Uh, so, I mean, you, you you could at some expense, and obviously in a way which would help high earners. Um, uh, you, you, you could just stop doing that, um, uh, or you could uh, uh, do you, 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 instead of having a 60% rate over 20,000 range, you could have a, a lower rate over a 50,000 uh, pound range, uh, for example. Now, I, I don't, I don't, I don't present that as a big priority. I don't think this does any great harm, except that you know, if you happen to be earning 120,000 pounds, you probably feel that's a little unfair. Okay. Well, given what you've said about the where the, the, the significant levers are around the economy still remaining with Westminster and the, and, and the UK government. And given that the new fiscal framework now means we've either got to match or, or outgrow the UK economy if we're going to have a, a net benefit to our settlement, um, what, what is there available to us within the basket that we do have where we could start to make a difference? Um. I mean, I think you know. I mean, there are things. I mean, there's, a, there's an issue between the short run and the long run. I mean, my view is that governments have a, quite a lot that they can do in the long run in terms of investing in appropriate infrastructure, having a good education um, uh, system, uh, an effective planning system, uh, uh, and things like that. So I think focusing on long run economic um, development uh, will pay dividends. Um, in the end, and certainly, you know, certainly, if you look at England, the um, slowness over making choices over um, big infrastructure uh, developments, whether it be Heathrow or um, anything else, clearly holds um, the UK back for you know, because of the trade-offs that are or that are involved. Having a Scottish system which is better at choosing infrastructure projects and doing them quickly. Uh, would help. Um, clearly, uh, the education system, I mean, again, looking at England, um, we have a dreadful system for uh, anyone who wants to move on from school at 16 or 18 into anything other than university, uh, and that holds the economy back. Uh, so if Scotland were to get that working better in particularly the FE sector, uh, that, that could have a significantly positive impact relative to um, relative to the rest of the UK, I think the other thing is is actually immigration. As I think we someone said earlier, actually Scotland has a much 
much less net immigration than the rest of the UK, uh, in a way which I find quite surprising in some ways, given that you've got some of the you know, world's best universities and so on here. Actually, anything which in attracts more um, people, not just high-skilled people, but certainly including high-skilled people into Scotland um, over time would clearly, particularly given the um, you know, overall uh, policy, would clearly be... Uh, you know, a, a, would clearly help you grow, and given the way that the formula works, would uh, would be a you know, big positive benefit. Okay, that's very helpful. Marie, I think you're a supplementary. Uh, yeah, just uh, something that dawned on me as I've been listening to all the d discussion this morning, I'm aware that there's been a, a downgrading in the credit rating of the UK, and I just wonder what impact that's likely to have on the public purse, given the cost of, of debt, and, and also where that is likely to head. Are there any predictions about where that's likely to head in the future with the shrinking of the economy that we've been chatting about this morning? I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think the downgrading in itself will have any impact. I'm not sure that the uh, if people if buying gilts take much notice of these things. I begin to wonder what the point of some of this is, if I'm honest. Uh, but but it, it could be taken as a symptom of um, you know, increased uncertainty about where the UK economy is going. So we've clearly got you know, without making any judgments, quite a lot of political uncertainty. We have a, a government which barely has a working majority, which makes, for example, increasing tax very difficult if that becomes um, necessary. And I think, you know, one of the, as I've said, one of the big constraints on the Chancellor will be the difficulty he would have getting any tax increases through Parliament. So political un uncertainty clearly creates risk. Uh, the uncertainty around whatever the Brexit deal might look like um, creates risk. Uh, you've got uh, an opposition party with, again, without making judgments, with uh, a set of economic policies which are very different from anything we've seen in, um, in, in a couple of generations. So again, people will see that as creating um, some kind of risk as well as potential um, opportunities. And so I think when you put all of that together, um, uh, then the concerns both about political capacity and about... Um, and about uncertainty over growth will weigh or might weigh eventually on people's willingness to purchase UK government debt. But let's be absolutely clear, at the moment it remains the case that people are desperate for this stuff <laughs> and, um, you know, and the interest rate being paid is extremely, uh, is extremely low by historical um, standards. Now, partly that's a good thing. It's also partly a reflection of concerns about the world economy because, you know, the fact that people are still willing to buy this stuff when it's got negative real returns is an indication of how worried people are, I think, about where the world economy is going. I think what starts to get really worrying for the UK, in a sense, and this may be where we're going, is a world in which um, investors get more confident about uh, the rest of the world. And we know that the Eurozone growth has been you know, really quite strong recently, if, the, if investors start to get more confident about the rest of the world and less confident about UK government, at that point, um, uh, the, the cost of this stuff may, may, start, may start to rise. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other MD else looking for supplementaries. Um, Paul, that was very useful, um, hour of your time. I'm very grateful for you coming along this morning and giving us your thoughts and uh, setting the context for us as we begin. To, to, to drive forward to the, the setting of our own budget here in Scotland uh, at the end of the year, the beginning of next year, and the context is important in that whole process. So we're very grateful to you, and I now suspend the meeting to allow a change of our witnesses.
Okay, uh, colleagues, the second item on our agenda today is to discuss the impact of Brexit on the Scottish economy, which is part of our focus on the budget scrutiny this year. And we're joined for this item by Professor David Bell, who's a fellow at the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and Professor David Heald, who's Professor of Public Sector Accounting at the University of Glasgow. Thank you both for providing us with your written responses, and I think we'll just get straight to questions. And Adam, uh, you're going to begin this uh, around some of the issues around growth, I think. Uh, th thank you, Camina. I suppose, for the record, I should say I'm also a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, <laughs> although I had no nothing to do with the preparation of these, of, of these papers. So whether that's a relevant interest to declare or not, I don't know. Um, uh, professors, you heard um, Paul Johnson, our earlier witness, say earlier this morning that there is an unprecedented level of uncertainty in the economy. Do you, do you both agree with that? Yes. I, I, th I think the, the really very striking thing is we've got a coincidence uh, of three major issues at the same time. Uh, the, the, fir the, the first one is that the basis on which the Scottish Parliament is funded has actually fundamentally changed. Uh, we're moving from, moving from a position uh, from 19... 99, when it was essentially funded by block grant, but with some, some tax powers in the form of the Titan tax and local government taxation, to a position where, to position where the uh, funding of the parliament depends upon, depends upon the performance of the UK economy and the performance of the Scottish economy relative to the, U, relative to the UK economy. Uh, we're also, the second point, is that we're going through the kind of longest period of fiscal austerity for 100 years, uh, not the deepest, uh, but generally speaking, when you have periods of public expenditure cuts and tax increases, they usually last for a relatively short number of years. Uh, it looks as the whole of the 2010s are going to be affected. Uh, and the third point is obviously Brexit. Uh, the, you, you've heard from the previous witness that the balance of, of economic opinion would be that the effect on the UK economy will be negative. Uh, that will lead to uh, lower, the lower affordability of public spending at the UK level and hence less money coming down, coming down the Barnett pipeline. Uh, what deeply concerns me about this is that the whole of the public debate uh, seems to be concentrating upon what I regard as a pretty irrelevant issue, and that is the divorce bill. Uh, the net UK contributions are about 1% of total, uh, total marriage expenditure. So it's a relatively small item that is actually dominating uh, public debate and creating a pretty toxic atmosphere between the U European Union and the United Kingdom, when it is important things like trade, trade and the relation future relationships that actually matter. Uh, I agree with the, the premise that we are in a period of, of uh, very considerable uncertainty. I just add a couple of points to what David has just said. Um, one in relation to austerity. Well, actually, what, li what, what also lies behind that is, is, is something that Paul Johnson was talking about, uh, which... which um, hasn't perhaps any it doesn't have its roots within Scotland certainly and that is whether a secular change is taking place uh, in in the UK's economic performance and indeed maybe beyond the UK in terms of the lack of productivity growth the slowness of recovery from this recession which as we've heard is almost historically unprecedented I, I've looked through the duration of the great crash and, and various other um, recessions that we've experienced, well, we exper well, maybe me more than most of you, experienced during the, the 20th century, and, and the duration uh, was much, much shorter than what we're experiencing now. And secondly, in relation to Brexit and the, um, the way that uh, Scotland's finances are now going to be determined, what will matter a lot is the relative performance effect caused by Brexit of the Scottish economy on the one hand relative to the rest of the UK economy on the other because that will ultimately have a bearing on the block grant adjustment and therefore the ability to fund public services. Given that you both um, agree that there is an unprecedented level of uncertainty, can I take you to some of the figures in particularly your paper, Professor Bell? Yeah. And you've given some you know, very disturbing, alarming, concerning 
figures about um, forecast um, of uh, growth, particularly as regards to GVA in various of um, Scotland's economic powerhouses and, 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 and cities. Given the level of uncertainty, how are we to how are we to take these figures? How serious are they? How robust are they? Yeah, I, th I, I mean, I do think uh, I think that's a fair point. So this is work done by um, uh, Overman and uh, Steve Machen at the LIC, which is based on an overall um, model of trade effects on on the UK. So it's looking at the long-term impacts of changing trade patterns in the first instance and then bringing those down to a spatial level and looking at the effect on areas and uh, cities. Now, I, I would treat them with, uh, you know, I, I would say they're indicative. I, I would not go further than that. Is there, is there any evidence at all um, to support... Um, uh, to support these figures, is there any is there any sense that these that I mean they're forecasts? We all know that forecasts yeah. can be can be can be wrong. They can sometimes be wildly wrong. Is there is there any evidence at all that these forecasts are uh, are correct? Or well, is it, is it just it, guesswork? Uh, well, they are forecasts, so we don't, we can't really know that until you know the 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 the, the time point by which they're. Um, they are uh, predicted to occur, and and one of the big difficulties around this that, that hasn't yet been mentioned is that the dynamics of this is really, really uncertain. So uh, if you remember, there were some who, who forecast the almost complete demise of the British economy the day after the referendum as a result of the, of the, of the Brexit vote. That, it seems to me, uh, was wrong, obviously wrong, but it also failed to... Um, or these forecasts failed to make clear that one of the, the particular uncertainties is around when things will happen. You know, if trading patterns change, how long does it take businesses to decide to change their investment plans? How long does it take to um, yeah. new contracts being made and, and so on? So uh, I would see these as being indicative. And, and, and the message that, that, that actually uh, is quite important that does underlie a lot of them is that areas that are particularly exposed are, are cities that are particularly exposed are those which have high concentrations of private sector service workers. And this is on the basis that, uh, uh, as we've heard earlier, trade agreements that uh, uh, have much by way of agreements around trade and services are pretty thin on the ground. Mm -hmm. And therefore, those, are, uh, the, the, those services are the things that may find post-Brexit life most difficult. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I saw you being interviewed, Professor Bell, about this by Gordon Brewer on, 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 on the television on, on, on Sunday. And he, he put to you the qu a question which I think would be useful to get on the record here as well, which is that, you know, if these indications, as you call them, um, are uh, the sorts of numbers upon which we should place any weight at all, wouldn't you expect to see already business confidence beginning to diminish, business investment plans beginning to change? Um, because these are um, plans that are made in anticipation of the way in which the economy is, is developing. And there is no evidence to support um, <laughs> in, 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 to support the idea that um, you know Glasgow's growth, for example, is going to be cut by the kinds of numbers that you've put in your paper. Well, so there's a, you know, it, it's difficult to disentangle. These are the effects of Brexit, and of course, we're living in in an economy where other things are going on as well. We've already sure. heard heard a discussion about the effects of um, uh, or the potential effects of the depreciation of the pound, which may, in some cities have had a, a beneficial yeah, effects. Yeah. So in trying to isolate those effects, which, which is what um, Overman and, and Machen have done, the, these are being placed a, a, in terms of a, a, a counterfactual which, where nothing else is going on, but always there's other stuff going on. Right. So we shouldn't place too much weight on these figures. I think, uh, well, I think they're useful indications, uh, <laughs> and I, I, th I think the basic point about trade, 
that we are in uh, currently in a, in a um, single market where we have uh, um, extremely uh, advantageous uh, uh, trading relationships and moving to one where there's great uncertainty and a lack of, and all kinds of issues that trade economists would say would make life more difficult. Uh, I, I think these are uh, the general lessons that are worth placing some weight on. Okay, could, could, I, could I just come in on the question of the relative performance of the Scottish economy? Um, that seems, because of the way the fiscal framework works, that seems to be a very important issue uh, for this committee. Uh, one of the things which concerns me is obviously the ramifications of the decline of the oil sector. I spent much of my working life working in the northeast of Scotland, and very clearly you're seeing uh, you're seeing effects on, on effects across the northeast economy of what's actually happening in oil. And I suspect also the, the the linkages are actually affecting the rest of the Scottish economy as well. So that in in terms of looking for why you might think that this is a period with a coincidence of the factors I mentioned, when the Scottish economy might perform worse than. The, the, the UK economy, uh, the ramifications of oil, oil are important. Uh, but also the, the question about what kind of deals will be done uh, to protect parts, important parts of the, UK, of, the, of the UK sector, of the UK economy. So, for example, if the UK government makes trade-offs that protect the financial sector, the, 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 there, may well be, there may well be benefits to the non uh, Scottish parts of the, of the UK, particularly the South East and London. So the relative, the relative performance has become very important because uh, because the, how much the Scottish Parliament will be able to spend will depend in part upon that relative performance and the effect on the block grant adjustment. Thank you. And Neil, I think you wanted to build on some of the questions. Yeah, that yeah just <coughs> just on the, the impact of, on, on, on cities and um, in, in Scotland and. Uh, the impact of Brexit. Obviously, there's, there's not going to be a uniform impact of Brexit. It's going to be felt um, differently in different areas. And I understand it as a forecast, but it would be wrong of us to ignore um, such warnings in terms of the impact that, um, you know, the, the figures that have been quoted on gross value added that Aberdeen likely to um, have a fall more than any other city in the UK, Edinburgh to fall by 3%, and obviously not just Ed, Ed, Aberdeen and Edinburgh, but also an impact in, in Dundee <coughs> and, and Glasgow. Um, I thought it was interesting what you are saying about the areas that will be worst affect have the highest level of private sector service workers, and if we've, you know, the evidence we've just heard suggests they are the lowest, you know, the lowest uh, paid workers. And um, what, what as, as a result of that, will be the impact on the poorest members of society as a result of, of, of the hit in terms of Brexit. And I note, Mr Bell, you say that the Scottish Government and the City Partnerships should consider how best to mitigate these, um, the impact that is going to be in the cities. And just ask what would be your um, your suggestions for how the Scottish Government and, and councils and city partnerships can best um, mitigate the impacts that they're going to be on the cities? Well. Firstly, it's true that uh, at the lower end of the uh, pay distribution, you find more <coughs> private sector workers than you do um, public sector workers. That's true. But it's also true that what we're talking about here are, 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 are effects that are uh, largely to do with trade and which, which parts of the economy are going to be most affected uh, by... Um, a different trading environment, and there it's going to be the higher paid private sector uh, workers that are more most likely to be affected. So for example, in, uh, uh, in Edinburgh, if it becomes more difficult for life sciences to uh, penetrate markets or for uh, high tech um, computing firms to, to uh, uh, break into new markets, then these are the uh, effects that are most likely to to impact uh, on the um, overall GVA in any particular city. And remember that as far as the relative performance uh, of Scotland is, is concerned, it is the higher earners, in a sense, that matter more because they are the bigger contributors to 
income tax revenues and it's, in, it's relative performance in relation to income tax per head uh, that, uh, that uh, will really uh, determine how the block grant adjustment is going to uh, evolve and therefore Scotland's finances. That's not to say that there won't be trickle down effects which will affect uh, poorer workers, but, but the uh, lesson I took from the Overman and Machen stuff wasn't necessarily that this is, this is something that will particularly affect poorer people. It will affect these cities as a whole because it will have an effect on their, a negative effect on their trading relationships with other, um, well, with whom they currently trade or, or, or potentially could trade in the future. And in terms of in terms of the the calling for the Scottish government and city partnerships to look at ways in which they can mitigate the potential well, impact on cities. And well, um, th I mean this. Uh, um, I could launch into a, a, an explanation which, which the committee might find interesting, it might not, uh, on, on this, but, but it is. So what happens to the structural funds is, is, is quite important What post-Brexit. So one possibility is that they move into, that that kind of money moves into the city partnerships. Mm. Um, what that does is it, uh, it changes, well, it sort of changes UK um, regional policy in this sense that we have some policies which are place neutral. And what that means is that to get them, you have to qualify um, in terms of income per head or some, some, um, uh, some measure of uh, relative... Uh, poverty or whatever, but, but the standard one that's been applied by the European Union in the latest budget is uh, regions which uh, fall below 70% of uh, EU average per capita income are eligible for direct support. Now that applies only now to Cornwall and West Wales. If that money is taken and put, in, put into city partnerships, then the money will be allocated to places where deals are being done in terms of um, engagement with other stakeholders, like the university in Edinburgh is a big stakeholder in the city deal. Obviously, the, the, the local authority is as well. And, and these deals are, are, are done um, with places where there are actors that are willing to engage with them. And what may happen as a result of this is that, is that places that would currently qualify for some sort of EU-type support, if, if there isn't a, a similar place-neutral um, uh, regional policy put in its place, then the, all of the money ends up concentrated <coughs> on the cities and you get left behind towns rural areas uh, and so on. So this has to be thought through very carefully. I, it's not clear what, what the UK government's thinking. It's thinking of setting up some kind of a fund, but it's, it's, it's thinking on this is, is not very clear and it, it is quite important in terms of, you know, both the social fund and the structural funds, uh, European, uh, uh, that currently come from Europe where they are going to end up. And obviously there's a, there's a decision that's got to be made about are they going to come to the Scottish government anyway uh, or are they going to be retained at the UK and distributed at the UK level? Willie. Thank you, yes. It's just on that very same issue. God, for, God forbid that the structural funds cash ends up in cities in Scotland only. That would be... Oh. North Ayrshire, East Ayrshire would throw their hands up in horror at the prospect of this, but you touched on, just in the last comment you made there, Professor Bell, that there needs to be a strategic approach to this. I mean, North Ayrshire's submission to us suggests, tells us that about up to 25% of Scottish Council spend in economic development comes from the European Union, and it, and it supports a wide range of things like infrastructure, business investment, and youth, youth unemployment, and supporting youth employment in the areas like North Ayrshire and uh, East Ayrshire. 
So the impact it's not, won't just be felt within the, the cities. Uh, I suggest to my, my colleagues around the table that there's a case to be made to have a regional policy in Scotland to continue to support these. So is there any work being done on, on that aspect that's out with the cities of Scotland to see what the, the Brexit impacts may be in the councils around the, the country? So some of the uh, parts of Scotland, and indeed you know, large swathes of England, qualify for transitional funding because there's, their income per head is between, I think, 70% and 90% of the EU average. And you get then European Social Fund money, which I, th I think is uh, uh, what, what you're uh, referring to there. Uh, the, there is no um, work, as far as I know, about that being done because of the uncertainty associated with, well, what's going to happen to these funds are they even going to be allocated towards regional development? Are they going to be allocated at a Westminster level, or are they going to be allocated to the devolved uh, uh, assemblies? And a lot of this goes back, um, Keynes said well, a, lo a lot of what uh, practical men do ends, uh, is really the, uh, uh, ultimately the, um, has been thought through by some economists long ago. And, and ultimately, this is this is based on on a difference between where you should allocate your money. Now, th this is not going to be good news for MSPs from rural areas. Basically, the argument uh, that uh, uh, has been put is that um, you get more returns by concentrating your uh, resources in cities, and that's actually what lies behind the initiatives that have been taken in relation to cities at UK level over the past 10 years or so. Um, now, you know, th this, this clearly goes against equity, but the argument is that efficient, efficiency suggests you should concentrate your, your resources in, in, in cities. I, 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 all I say is that these are, these are uh, uh, um, the kinds of thinking that lie behind decisions about allocation of, of resources to different uh, different parts of the country, and we, we currently have a very mixed uh, economy. We have a, a mixed economic development um, kind of setup, where uh, you have you have the EU not really caring about where the money goes, as long as the money goes to a place that qualifies. And then on the other hand, the UK government and the Scottish government with uh, you know, city proposals where they try to get people together uh, to, uh, to agree on policies to uh, promote the growth of those cities. We've, we've now gone on to the question about what happens about functions that are going to be repatriated. <laughs> Uh, the, the, there's much talk in the media of a power grab by the UK government, and uh, which has upset the upset the devolved administrations. Uh, but there's a crucial question. There's a crucial question about whether there will be UK common framework, will be UK common frameworks, uh, for example, in the context of context of agricultural subsidies, and also the question of how they will be financed. Uh, because the, the, the very, obviously the UK government could keep everything and just run it, run everything from the Treasury. Alternatively, the money could be the existing Scottish spend on the on, on, on these EU presently EU finance functions could be transferred into the into the Scottish block with future changes going through future changes going through the Barnett formula. Now, the very the, one of the points I make in my memorandum: this will introduce a new a new set of controversies into the budget process because there will be a direct conflict between spending money on nurses and spending money on sheep. So the question, it will, because it was done within a European framework, uh, the budget was actually segmented. This, these, these two budgets were not, these two budgets were not fungible. As soon as you actually put it into the block, there's a question of whether the future changes that come through Barnet are sufficient to pay for uh, the agricultural, agricultural subsidies and the question about what, re what relative priority should be given. So in terms of, in terms of turning the focus to the specifics of the budget process, this seems to be a really very important issue for the committee to think about. Can I, thank you. Can I just 
Well, you finished. On you, know, you go. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, can, I can just uh, almost see my colleagues in East Ayrshire, North Ayrshire, South Ayrshire reaching for the emails at the moment in horror <laughs> at, at, at the prospect of a city-only regional kind of policy here, uh, and, and we'll get the spin-off spin -off benefit from that, of course, as we always have done. Uh, I don't think they'll really follow that. Do you think there's a need then for a, a more regional policy to develop in Scotland about these types of frameworks so that we don't get left out and it's not just the cities that get, get the attention through regional policy? I, I uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think that one thing you could certainly argue is that this kind of policy that, that I've been describing and I, I don't necessarily <laughs> subscribe to uh, doesn't <laughs> doesn't take account of the externalities associated with them. And one of the externalities that we've seen for a long time in, in Scotland is is the effects of young people being attracted to cities and other parts of the country being left with much more uh, challenging age structures than than uh, than the. Um, uh, than the, the, the average over Scotland as a whole. And the consequences of that, a lot of it has to be borne by public service costs, uh, higher costs for hosp hospitals and, and, uh, and care and, uh, and so on. So uh, my, I, I think there is a, a good case for looking at economic development in the round, uh, uh, one which I don't really believe that the UK government is has done uh, and taking into account these these kinds of externalities and also taking account of the equity considerations it's not not just about efficiency in terms of driving up GDP it's also about partly about maintaining a balance between different parts of the country I'm sorry to take it back a bit because David Bell said something about the impact on higher rate taxpayers and the potential for greater attrition in that area in terms of jobs, etc. When you compare that along with some of the stuff the, in your, your paper, David Heald, where you talked about the numbers being striking from from the HMRC work that was done in 2017, where at bullet point one on page four, you say of the 2,600, 2,601,000 Scottish income taxpayers in 14-15 paying 1.68 billion, 4.38 percent, with those greater income than 50 percent, accounted for 38.39 percent of that total. I think that that's worthy of a bit more discussion just now about the impact on that sector as a result of leaving the single market and Brexit, because that could have quite potential serious consequences for income tax take in Scotland, from what I'm hearing, if I've got that right. So I don't know who... who David Hill, do you want to pick that up first? Yeah, I mean, when I originally, about seven or eight years ago, uh, saw those figures in the HMRC survey of personal incomes, I was actually sufficiently shocked that I thought I'd actually calculated them wrong. But they broadly consistent from year to year. Roughly speaking, 5% of income taxpayers produce 40% of Scottish income tax revenues. So it, what it does is it shows the importance of thinking carefully when the Scottish Parliament sets tax bans, takes tax bans uh, and rates about the effect upon that effect upon that group. So there are two issues. One, the one you directly raised, uh, and certainly uh, the, the people in the the all set private services in the all sector have actually had very high have had very high incomes. So the, the question there are there are issues about issues about what's actually happening not just because of Brexit, but because of other things as well. And so the, one, of, one, of the th one of the things one's got to be very careful about is to think about what the relationship is between the Scottish tax regime and the UK, and the UK tax regime. Now, I, I was one of the people who was behind the tartan tax 40, 30, 30 years ago. Uh, one of the things that happened with the tartan tax was it atrophied because there was so much money coming down the Barnet, b b down the Barnet pipeline. And it's very important, very important that the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government do not allow the Smith Commission tax powers to atrophy. But the point I'm making is they actually have to be used carefully. And to make a broader political point, the, the, the idea that you can fund, fund 
public services, increases in public services or protecting public services solely by taxing, taxing uh, the well-off uh, for example, the additional rate taxpayers, I think is wrong. So I think that one has to, that if, if Scotland, in the, this context of austerity, of continuing austerity and pressure on public, pressure on public services, if Scotland wishes, wishes to spend more relative to what the bloc would fund, Scotland actually has to face the fact that this will have to be broad-based, the, the, the income tax powers will be have to use across the, across the spectrum. One thing, one thing which the, the Scottish Parliament has got is it hasn't got control over the personal, hasn't got control over the personal allowance. Uh, trying to use a zero uh, a zero percent band would create complications with social with certain social security benefits, but it does actually have it does actually have control of those bands. And I've for a long time I've taken the view that the higher rate threshold was too low. And so what the UK did from the 1980s was actually move to a basically a two rate uh, two rate system, uh, basic rate, higher rate, and certainly to think about think carefully about uh, what the carefully about what those bands would be. So people on an income of 43,000 don't actually go from 20% to 40%. The practical difficulty we have uh, is the, the Scottish Parliament doesn't control national insurance. So when one's talking about the effect on, uh, on individuals and households, one's got to think very carefully about the relationship between, between marginal rates of combined income tax and income tax and national insurance. Okay. Uh, that's, that's very useful, but can we just, for, this, for a moment, just assume all things are equal uh, in terms of where Scottish taxation is, and it may or may not shift. But from what I heard from David Bell was that if all things are equal, nothing changes in the Scottish tax system, there's still going to be a potential negative effect on these higher taxpayers as a result of Brexit. So if we, if we do nothing, there's going to be an impact potentially in the Scottish budget in terms of how much income we're going to get from income tax. Would you like to say a bit more about that, David? Taking in, obviously, taking into context what David Hill said as well as the impact of the choices we decide to make, but the broader point. So I think there's a level effect and a relative effect as far as the Scottish budget is concerned. <clears throat> the level effect is that um, uh, Brexit, um, other things being equal, is more likely to induce... Um, Falls in income at the at the higher um, at the amongst higher earners, or indeed the emigration of higher earners, particularly EU nationals currently living in Scotland, whether that be from the public service or or or, or, or the private sector. So, um, and that is because these people are um, closer to. Um, or have easier access to markets or, or, or uh, countries, polities outside the UK where they may uh, prosper relative to the, the UK. So that more than l the low paid worker, the, the, they're considering these options a lot of the time. And the relative is effect comes through the block grant adjustment. And, and really then the question is who is doing worse the rest of the UK in terms of high earners or Scotland. That might off partly, if, and, and it, uh, notwithstanding the forecasts for uh, difficulties um, that particular cities may face, I think overall the expectation is that uh, Scotland would be uh, less affected uh, than, than, than the rest of the UK. How that comes through in terms of those at different levels of earnings we don't we don't it's difficult to predict uh, at the moment uh, but uh, and that can affect the block grant adjustment clearly so, so only really is in, in that what happens to the city of London mm -hmm. that's the that's the question incredibly for the Scottish block grant what happens to the city of London will have a huge impact on what happens in Scotland. Yes, and although although we have no um, 
direct evidence yet from investment intentions. I, I, I was yesterday at my daughter's uh, primary school in Wimbledon, and her, uh, her class has been depleted by six uh, in the last year of um, six uh, kids whose parents are European. So there is evidence of already some changes uh, that, that are taking place, but that, you know, before these enter the official statistics, um, this is just hearsay. So probably well, get, this is probably getting into trouble, but it probably means in Scotland that to make sure we further Scottish interests, we're going to stand up for the city of London. There's some things. <laughs> Can I tweet that? <laughs> if I could come back, come back in, I, I mean, the, I did see it would get me in trouble. Be, be, because, be, because it's such an important Probably technical point, in. we've been tending to stress the question of the relative performance of the Scottish economy to the, to the rest of the UK economy. But, but I think the biggest effect on Brexit, the biggest effect on Brexit on the Scottish economy, the Scottish budget, will be if the UK economy does badly. Yeah. Because if the UK economy does badly, right. we're likely to get an even longer period of austerity. So I think we, we must, everybody must understand the significance of the block grant adjustment and the fact that relative performance matters. But my major concern would be about the overall effect of the, on the UK economy at a time when there are other reasons, like the decline of oil, where one's worried about the Scottish economy. OK, it's all complicated stuff. Um, Ash. I was going to ask about that. Sorry, uh, sorry, apologies. I just realised, uh, my apologies, there were two people who, who had supplementaries in this area, so forgive me. Apologies. Uh, Murdo and Patrick. Just, just a very apologies. brief point, um, Professor Hill. I wanted to, to come back on your use of the term atrophy in relation to the Scotland Act tax powers. Um, I don't really understand that, that language because the Scottish Parliament has to set tax rates now on an annual basis. We have to have a positive vote in Parliament to set the tax rate. Now, it may well be the choices, as some of us would argue, to keep tax rates in line with the rest of the UK. Others will argue for a different choice. But how, how is it atrophy if the Scottish Parliament is actually making a positive vote to set tax rates? Um, that I, I, I take your point. I, I was thinking very much about the 1999 Tartan tax power. Now, I was around when, when that, those powers were being discussed, and what people didn't appreciate at the time, certainly I didn't, was the significance of the Parliament not having to have a positive vote. And one of the consequences of the Parliament not having to have a positive vote is we found, we found that, that over time it became much more difficult to use the powers because they'd been unused, and then the administrative machinery collapsed without the Parliament being told that the administrative machinery being, uh, had, been, uh, had, had collapsed. The, the, my, concern about the, my concern about the present powers in the, in the 2016 Act is, though I, I take your point that a positive decision has to be made, and that is, that is, that is welcome, but the longer one goes with, with no or minor use, of those, minor use of those powers, I think there is a danger that, the, that, for example, the preparedness of HMRC to actually, uh, actually be able to execute uh, those powers will actually decline. So I think that the, the by, atro by atrophying, I mean that if, you, that if you don't use powers, over time the administrative machinery, machinery disintegrates, uh, and of course it's costly, it's costly, and to, to maintain it, and secondly, the political the, the political difficulty of making a decision become, uh, become, becomes more severe. More severe. Patrick, thank you. Um, good morning uh, to both of you. Uh, I, I would like to hope that the um, the discussion paper the Scottish government has committed to to producing on uh, income tax is an opportunity to avoid the atrophy that. Uh, that you're, you're talking about. Um, Professor Heald, though, your, your written submission uh, uses, uh, uses a phrase that I found interesting. For each tax within the Scottish Parliament's portfolio of taxes, there will be those who advance plausible or specious arguments about the economic benefits of tax reduction. Uh, you, you mentioned a, a number of examples uh, in relation to that, such as aviation tax. Is there a, a, a danger that income tax becomes seen in the, in the same way, uh, and that that leads to the kind of tax competition uh, which leaves uh, all parts of the, the UK's uh, revenue worse off 
uh, rather than anything that creates a, a benefit? Um, yes. I think that, that one, of, one of the things that, that filled me with a, a certain amount of disquiet during the discussions about the Smith Commission is that, that lots of people in Scotland seem to think that having more tax powers would mean you'd be able to spend more. So the, 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 build, you know, the, the reason why Scotland seemed to want more tax powers was so it could actually spend more to have a more generous welfare state and better public services. However, there's always been a different strand of argument, uh, the, the different strand of argument that, that if a subnational government actually has to raise its own tax powers, it will actually spend less. Uh, th that, that, that's possibly one of the reasons why one went from a position whereby there was very substantial opposition to the Tartan tax in, 19, in, 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 in the time of the 97 referendum, uh, to the position whereby almost everybody was competing to give Scotland more taxpayers at the time, time of the Smith Commission. One of the difficulties, of course, is that Scotland, although it's got very substantial tax powers now, uh, those tax powers interact with other taxes. The, the, the whole question is the UK has got two income taxes. Uh, in, my, in my view and the view of most economists, uh, national insurance is essentially a second income tax, which is in, in the UK. And so the interaction of them, the interaction of them is actually, is, is actually very, very important. Uh, so that um, you, you, you will probably remember uh, that the, under, the Labour, under the Labour government, uh, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown promised not to increase income tax, so they increased national, insur increase national insurance contributions. So the, the, the political relationship between those two is, is, is important. Inco what is called income tax mm. is, get, gets, is probably far better understood than the operation of the national, of the, of the national insurance system. The other issue, of course, is, is that the Scottish... Um, Parliament doesn't set the tax base uh, for income tax, and, it, and the income tax powers only relate to non-savings and dividend income. So that there are there are going to be issues about the relationship between the personal income tax and possible avoidance strategies, such as incorporation incorporation into companies, and the, also the question about the move to self-employment and the question of relative enforcement. Um, n not for the first time, I think, uh, Adam and I have uh, apologies to make to the country on behalf of the Smith Commission uh, for the, the complexity of the, the, the process, if nothing else. Um, the, I, I want to sort of park some of what we talked about because it's not directly relevant to the, the discussions about the, the Brexit context at the moment, although it's, it's obviously uh, of huge uh, importance generally. And I, I think the, the, the political will... Uh, to, to take a different tax policy is far more important than just uh, the debate on powers. Scotland has had very broad powers on, on taxation for local services, and there can be no greater example of atrophy uh, than, uh, than the, the failure to do anything uh, serious with them uh, over the years. The, the kind of potential changes that you've talked about which relate to, to, to Brexit, which you've both touched on, uh, uh, around whether people move, whether people leave, uh, whether people uh, organise their affairs in a different way uh, in response to, uh, to, to what's happening with Brexit and with the economy. Um, bring me to this, this question about the potential impacts of tax changes at the additional and higher rates. Uh, and the argument has been made repeatedly uh, that uh, increasing tax at the additional rate may not generate additional revenue because there'll be behavioural changes. Now, that may be exacerbated in the, in the context of Brexit, where people might already be thinking about, about relocating or arranging their affairs differently. But I've asked repeatedly a number of people, including the government, whether there is any evidence that the same thing applies at the higher rate as this argument being advanced at the additional rate. Is either of you able to answer the question, is the higher rate uh, of tax or a potential increases at the higher rate equally vulnerable to these kind of behavioural effects as the additional rate? Uh, and is there any reason for, for being able to estimate the, the, the size of that effect? 
um, I couldn't help on the question of estimating the size. Uh, the point I would make is there are very few, very few additional rate taxpayers in Scotland. The number that you see widely quoted is 17,000. Uh, so very, very small. There's obviously a lot more higher rate, higher rate tax taxpayers. Um, my, my more, more general point about the, about the higher rate threshold is the higher rate threshold. When the higher when the higher rates start, uh, were, were were operating in the past, uh, it was not expected they would catch people with with moderate with moderate incomes in the way that in the way that they do now in, in the way they do now. So the, the, my, argu my, my argument about the higher rate threshold being too, be, being too low and insufficient graduation of the system is, is more of an equity argument. I, I basically think that you know, the, 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 the higher rate threshold, higher rate threshold I, I, is low. Uh, the, 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 there's a really very important question about how much attention HMRC pays to the enforcement of residence rails. Uh, going back to the question of additional rate, of, of additional rate taxpayers, I suspect that a lot of additional rate taxpayers in Scotland may have other residences. Uh, so the question about the extent to which the extent to which HMRC actually polices uh, resi residents and make sure uh, and make sure that the system actually operates as legislative it's intended to do uh, is, is important. In the, context, like in the context of the higher rate. Uh, I was talking. Yeah, yeah. It, it applies generally. It applies generally about generally about enforcement. But it, because, because so much money comes from the additional rate, it, it, it's obviously and and the, the potential gains for avoid from avoidance behaviour become become greater. Um, on the on on the point about the higher rate, I think perhaps the the greater concerns are about are are about uh, incorporation. Uh, you may well remember that Gordon Brown, as Chancellor, provoked an, an enormous increase in incorporation uh, by having a zero rate, a zero rate band of corporation tax. So there is evidence from the past that taxpayer behaviour can actually be quite, actually be quite sensitive. And the UK is in a, the UK is in a very unusually fiscally centralised state. Um, if you go to Canada or United States, the idea that a different province or, or state might have a different income tax or no income tax at all would create no surprise whatsoever. So or both geographically, as well. yeah, geographically compact country like the United Kingdom with no tradition of income tax is being differentiated geographically. One has to be, one has to make sure the administrative system works properly. And obviously, requires, in my view, requires to be caution in the way that those powers are operated. Uh, but a more, uh, on a more political level, uh, I, would, I, I would repeat the point that if the parliament wishes to, wishes to protect public services from future austerity, the, tax, the use of the income tax power should be, broad -based, should be across the board, uh, should, should certainly not be solely concentrating on the additional right or, or the higher right. Caution but not atrophy. Caution but not atrophy, yeah. Uh, and, uh, Professor Bell, I think, wants to say something, but uh, presumably you would agree that changing the higher rate threshold is not the only or perhaps not the most effective way of achieving better graduation. We, we don't need to assume that one basic rate for this entire swathe of, uh, of income uh, range needs to stay forever. I agree absolutely. Thank you. Um, Bell. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I agree pretty much with, uh, with what David has just said. Just to point out, um, I mean, you, uh, well, let me just say that there, uh, as far as I'm aware, um, Paul may uh, have different views, but I, I don't know of any evidence on the higher rate per se. Mm -hmm. it, and it, I, I do know it's quite difficult to, to work out the effects. Um, but just to add to what you were saying earlier, what, uh, another option that people might be taking is in relation to bro Brexit is not to come. Mm. And that's that actually for the higher education sector at the moment is something that that we are we are we, we are uh, pretty much aware of. Then, in terms of uh, income tax in general, um, uh, Brexit perhaps might uh, for for certain classes of worker um, make the uh, move option. Uh, one of one one thing that's been considered more than has been in the past. David has said, talked about the redefine option, which is um, around incorporation, 
uh, for, for higher rate uh, payers. There are other two kind of classic reactions which, uh, which people might have to, to higher tax rates. One is to cut hours, so you work fewer hours, and that's important probably for married women and for older workers in general. The other is to drop out completely, you know, to decide to decide to uh, uh, that, that uh, life uh, holds other challenges than than working. Um, now that's uh, you may think well that doesn't really happen very much among working age uh, 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 people. But one of the big changes, and in a sense, it references to what Paul Johnson was saying about intergenerational equity that has happened in the last 10 years is that the fastest growing uh, group of workers are those aged 50 plus. And indeed, uh, the HMRC are, are, have, have said they're uh, very much surprised at the increase in income tax revenues from those aged 65 plus. So people are staying on longer and that actually is helping to boost uh, income tax revenues. I mean, I, I think there is a huge opportunity to do some work on this, to try to understand this better. But, but when you're trying to think about bans and rates, you have to think about all these different options that people might have uh, uh, w when confronted by either a fall or a rise. Thank you. Ash. Um, I was just going to ask you about the Brexit divorce bill. I know, Professor Heald, you've said that you think this is pretty irrelevant in the wider scheme of things, but it does seem to have caught people's imagination somewhat. Um, so the RSE uh, paper mentions that the bill, or it suspects the bill, might be around the £36 billion mark. Um, and I'll just uh, read this part of the paper. It says, if, however, additional payments form part of the final divorce bill, then there are likely to be consequences for the Scottish budget. Could you explain that for us? Um, I'm trying to remember why, uh, uh, why that was the case in the paper. Um, so uh, I guess it, 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 if there's a, some kind of a, a, a negotiation, um, uh, if, if, if the sorry, if the, if the UK is paying more than it's expected mm -hmm. to. Uh, to the EU, then there will obviously not be consequentials because the other things it might have spent its money on, like more health and more education, won't be available as options to it. So the higher the bill to exit the EU, the less money is available for UK domestic services and to the extent to which they have Barnet consequentials, then that would affect uh, uh, the Scottish budget, and you know, w we've heard that some parts of the uh, of the uh, public services budget are under huge pressure at the moment. Health being a kind of obvious one, and that would immediately have Barnet consequentials. So, I, th I think that was the way we were thinking uh, uh, in in relation to what the wording of the paper. Uh, one, of, one, one, one of the one of the aspects of the devolved funding system, even after the fiscal framework, is how much discretion is in the hands of the Treasury. So the, 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 if, if the UK paid 50 billion divorce bill, uh, it would depend upon whether the Treasury said that had to be fitted within one year or several years against the existing envelope of total margin expenditure. If, if the Treasury said this is a one-off, it wouldn't have any Barnett consequences, whatever uh, it, it wouldn't displace expenditure, would generate violent consequences. So this, this is a very good example of, of how, even after the fiscal framework, so much depends upon the discretion of the Treasury. So at this point, is there any way to put any numbers on what the impact of the Scottish budget might be, or is it too early to say? Well, it would depend on what, I mean, you know, the, 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 the big choice is whether the UK, well, there's, there's two big choices. One, is, is it a lump sum payment in one year or is it spread over a number of years? And then the second choice is, does it actually score against existing expenditure totals or do we just say this is a one, th th this is a one off? If it, if it scored against existing expenditure totals, it would depend what got displaced, whether what was displaced was Barnet relevant or not Barnet relevant. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
Marie? Um, as a representative of the Highlands and Islands, you can imagine that I am hearing a great deal of concern about um, the potential uncertainty around cat funding. And I wondered if um, either of you would be able to give me an idea of just how significant a contributor that is to the economy compared to maybe other forms of EU funding. <laughs> um, I, it, well, um, I've forgotten what the, the, the current Scottish spend on CAP is. Um, Clear. About 500. I, I about was going to say 470 million was, yeah. my, was my guess. Um, so uh, clearly, you know, in terms of the overall Scottish budget, it's it, it's still relatively small. But I, I think in terms of the role that it will play in relation to the general Brexit debate its role will be much larger than its size in the economy because there will be uh, a conflict around which powers are retained at Westminster and which are um, a, handed on to the Scottish Government. And you can, you can see this, um, the agenda here is uh, um, in relation to free trade, it seems to me, uh, and the uh, so currently um, there there are certainly a group within the government that are very keen on free trade, and free trade means no uh, uh, tariff barriers on goods traded, and those uh, uh, goods that are traded, the highest tariffs currently are on agricultural goods. Uh, by some distance, they are the highest tariffs. Uh, so, um, things like beef, I think we're talking 80%, that kind of, uh, that kind of rate. So, um, if a uh, UK government wanted to enter into a deal with another country, a free trade deal, then the uh, ability of the UK government to continue to subsidise agriculture would be uh, 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 un under question. Um, interestingly, the EU, um, in the deal with Canada, has uh, uh, that deal does not has not resulted in changes to the cap in Europe. We know that and the cap hasn't changed. So here, relative strength matters. If you're doing a deal with someone, then uh, you know who's got more at stake is 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 a key question. And if the UK wants to be in a position where it, everything it, it, it's willing to put everything uh, on the table because it wants concessions and maybe in some other for some other sector, mm -hmm. then its ability to protect continue to protect agriculture may come under threat. So this comes back to the point I raised before about whether there are going to be common frameworks uh, in, the, in the areas where previously you didn't need a UK common framework because there was a U EU common framework. Uh, and then, then the, su the subsidiary question is who actually makes the decisions about it. Is it something which is negotiated with the devolved administrations, which are wh whose agriculture sectors are more dependent on subsidies than, than is England, uh, or is it something the UK government is going to Im going to impose, <coughs> either because the UK government wishes to assert itself, or whether it wishes to keep its hands free in the context of the free trade agreements that David Bell was speaking about? Interestingly, the, the part of the UK that's most dependent, much more so than Scotland, on, on agriculture subsidies in Northern Ireland. Um, yeah, can I just further say, I mean, when, we, when we were talking about the efficiency versus equity, I would hear the argument regularly in the Highlands that actually cap funding is one of the most efficient ways to put, inject money into the local economy, because farmers, certainly in the Highlands and Islands, the, the money goes straight direct from the farmer's pocket 
into paying vet bills or for purchasing feed, things like that. Have you any thoughts around that? Would there be a more efficient way to subsidise a rural economy if that well, option is not available to the UK? So, Presuming the power is clear. Yeah. So, um, the um, EU over the years has gradually moved away from the idea of subsidising output. So subsidising the production of wine or the sub subsidising the production of sheep or whatever it is and has moved more into the, the uh, um, trying to encourage farmers to produce um, a, um, the kinds of goods that it wants. And that might be things like a better environment rather than the production of, of sheep. And I think it also wants to protect rural communities. You know, it, it, it also has that as uh, so that there are different streams of funding that go through the cap. Uh, I mean, some of them may end up in vets bills, but there are different streams of funding. And I think, you know, standing back, uh, there's a question about, well, what is it that you actually want to produce from agricu the, the agriculture sector to produce? Is it vibrant rural communities? Is it... Uh, 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 an outstanding environment, or is it uh, um, more output? And the way that you design the agricultural payment system will ha will, ref will will cause the incentives that farmers face to do one thing rather than another thing. And so, um, you know, this is the, you know the the. This is all up for grabs if if we're if we're about to redesign our our uh, agricultural support system. Indeed, if we are to have one at all, then then these kinds of issues uh, have have to be thought through. And and and, and um, it, it's uh, it's an issue for the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government. And I'm imagining there might be significant <coughs> policy differences in those areas that you've just mentioned well, here, between the Scottish government and the UK government. Uh, they're bound to be because basically the structure of agriculture is quite different. You know, mm -hmm. what happens in, in Scotland in, is not the same in terms of the, the structure of agricultural production in, uh, in England and indeed Wales is also different. Okay. Ivan, you. you've got a supplementary on that? Um, no, it's a couple of other points. Well, okay, let me, let, me, let me go to Murdo first then on structural yes, fund issues. Yeah, well, there's a, a couple of points I want to raise. One's on structural funds. I mean, listening to all you had to say, which is, which is very interesting, I think we all understand Scotland does relatively better out of structural funds than many other parts of the UK. Therefore, the answer, well, you can yeah. tell, tell me if you agree or disagree on that, but what I'm trying to get to, therefore, is, is um, if we're replacing these structural funds with some other source of funding, then that needs to come not through the Barnett formula process, which might disadvantage Scotland, but through some new system of um, regional policy funding. Is that really what, what you're saying? Well, the, the, in the past, when the, the Scottish Parliament's got new functions, the rail, the rail franchising being the obvious, obvious important example, what actually happens is that the spend in the year before it happens gets transferred into the block and then subsequently use the formula. So it's not a question of getting a population share of, 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 of UK spend. Yeah, I, I agree with, with David uh, on that. And just another point that, that, that sort of lies behind this and I didn't really um, uh, bring out. So the, uh, another thing that, that, that will be up for grabs is the... Um, ability of different parts of the UK to um, provide direct support to industry. So Scotland uh, um, uh, has, with EU agreement, for many years uh, been able to uh, spend money on regional selective assistance for uh, particular uh, companies coming in or their under certain conditions, 
the uh, EU agreed with Scotland that that didn't jeopardise the internal market significantly and therefore the regional selective assistance died a long, long time ago in England and it's not, it, it's, it's not one of the uh, options that, that is allowed to be uh, applied in, uh, uh, in England. So um, not only are, is there the size of the structural funds but there's also all of the rules around where support can be given and where support uh, cannot be given uh, that need to be thought through and, and it appears that the EU was content for Scotland to have a somewhat slightly different set of rules than, than, than was applied in England and therefore when these come up for discussion you know the, 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 the it will be in, interesting to to uh, to uh, see whether the UK government is willing to negotiate a continuation of that diff that kind of difference between different parts of the UK. If you look at the Treasury's annual public expenditure statistical analysis, you'll see that the index of public of public expenditure on economic development in Scotland is vastly higher than the UK average. So these so, so within within the kind of umbrella of EU funding, Scotland's maintained a more a, a more a system of industrial support, which, as, as David Bell said, has, has tended to wither in England. So that will be one of the when, in terms of the internal market, uh, internal UK market. Uh, framework. This is obviously going to be one of the issues up to up to discussion. I mean, one of the one of the things that concerns me, both the expenditure side and the tax side, is that freed from EU constraints, which everybody's blamed for lots of things, uh, there is a danger of competitive subsidy bidding within the within, within the UK, and also the, the a danger of of, of competitive uh, competitive. Uh, bidding on the tax side, as in the, in the as with proposals to reduce air passenger jitter. Are we going to lose these into that, though? Uh, my my view my view would be that Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland should avoid that kind of competitive bidding with England. Interesting. Although it does happen to an extent already. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I've got one other question that I can on a slightly different topic, and it follows up from from Ash Denham's questions about the impact on the, the budget. And, and the thing that seems to me that's missing from both your papers is any recognition that there will be a net benefit to the, e the UK finances from leaving the EU. Now, it might not be £350 million a week, but um, Paul Johnson said earlier it would be £8 billion a year net. So even factoring in the prospect of a divorce bill in the longer term, this does not mean that there is more money potentially to spend than less. On the, if it, I, was, I was sat at the back listening to Paul Johnson's evidence, and what he did say is the overall fiscal effect would be negative because, because of the effect on, on, on the forecast growth of the yeah. UK economy. But, yeah, but yes, I, I mean, the UK, UK I've, I've seen various figures for UK contribution in different years, but it's about 8 to 10, 8 to 10 the net contribution is about 8 to 10 billion. But, but that's, one mustn't just look at the budget numbers, one's got to think about what the, what the what the affordability of future plans are in relation to the growth of the growth of the economy. So yes. I don't think yeah. I don't think I, I, I don't think it's valid at all. You, on one level, it's right to say that eight eight billion pound will be freed up, but the overall economic context will be more difficult. Well, that that's the forecast, as you say. Sure. And, and as we know, forecasts may or may not come out to be true. I'm just I'm just surprised that that. None of that was recognised in either of your submissions that you made to, uh, to, to the committee. Anyway, yeah. point Ivan. Uh, thanks, thanks, convener. Thanks, uh, panel. Um, a couple of things, or two or three things, actually, I just wanted to touch on very briefly. The first one was to go back to something that uh, Neil Bibby had raised earlier on, asked the question about what's the best thing that government could do to mitigate the impact on the cities of the impact of Brexit. Would you agree that surely the best thing that can be done to mitigate that effect is to find a way to stay in the single market? Um, my personal view is that the UK shouldn't leave uh, the single market or shouldn't leave the customs union. Um, I accept that the direction of travel is that both will happen. I mean, I, my view is that it's the 
it, it, it is likely to happen irrespective of whether I think it's a good idea or not. I, I think there, well, I mentioned scenario planning in, 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 the, in the, our paper. And I, th I think, you know, there is an argument now for thinking through, well, what are the implications of different types of uh, uh, Brexit? Uh, and indeed, you know, the, a hard Brexit would pose particular challenges to industry. And um, I guess the Scottish Government uh, might have a role in trying to uh, mitigate the effects of these uh, challenges that that uh, that industry might be be uh, facing issues like you know our financial sector what are, what are the what are the issues that it might face accessing markets that it currently faces if there is no agreement and we fall back on WTO rules what what would be the challenges that that uh, that it faces oh. we know that RBS is thinking of setting up an office in Amsterdam I think. Um, so, you know, I think I think I think there are pro possibly some some real issues for possibly even some quite small businesses in in Scotland, food exporters. What what are the kinds of things that that they need to be thinking sure. about if they want to uh, uh, get through a situation where there's a hard Brexit? Yeah, but a soft Brexit. Well, to my definition, would mean staying in the single market, either a UK context or potentially in a Scottish context through a differentiated solution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Second point was just, and I can't let this go, but I'm surprised that people are surprised that only 4% of the tax base raises 40% of the revenue. I mean, that's just classic Pareto. So it's, um, nobody should really be surprised, surprised at that. Um, my main substantive point was around about immigration, and it's something that you've raised on the, um, uh, in, in your paper. Um, David, um, so I suppose I just wanted to explore a bit further, and you heard my question to Paul Johnston on that earlier, what the impact of the significant reduction in net immigration into Scotland would be, or potentially um, net migration, um, on growth rates and on public uh, sector finances, given the age profile, um, and on the tax taking pension rates that that would cause in the kind of medium to long term. And as a follow up to that, um, if Scotland was able to achieve a differentiated immigration solution, similar to what they have in Canada and Australia, what opportunities that would present to the Scottish government and the Scottish economy? Um, so, my um, argument, I guess, is that um, given that Scotland attracts a relatively small proportion of UK migrants, which is surprising given its income per head. It's Scotland is an outlier. You know, given its income per head, you would expect Scotland to attract quite a lot more. It doesn't. Uh, we don't exactly know why, why that's the case. Um, but if the UK um, reduced net immigration to the tens of thousands, then uh, you, it, it would be difficult to see net immigration to Scotland being anything more than 10,000, and even that might be uh, 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 pushing it. Now, that has, over the long term, demographic implications, because effectively what you're saying is that the population is bounded by um, a lack of net inflow deaths and births more or less equalize each other. So therefore the population more or less stabilizes at whatever it is at the moment, 5.4 million, some, something like that. So now what effect that has on the economy, again, Paul Johnson, uh, it, it is important to differentiate between uh, GDP overall and GDP per head. If the population's not increasing, um, then uh, 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 GDP could be stable. GDP per well, head. Growth rates are always based on GDP and total. They are. So they are. They are. Stick to that but, for, yeah, but I mean, in terms of what living standards, it's GDP per head that 
that, 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 that actually matters. So, I mean, certainly a slowdown in migration would, would result in slower GDP growth. More difficult to say what would affect GDP per head, but um, you've got this other um, uh, effect that you, that you mentioned, the ageing of the population ongoing, which would which already is affecting Scotland more than the rest of the UK. And therefore, more people are outside the labour, a relatively larger proportion of people are outside the labour market than is the case in the rest of the UK, unless there's a continuation of, of people working on more, you know, into their 60s and 70s and so on. Um, so... Uh, what that what that looks like is is certainly a less optimistic view of the Scottish economy going uh, into the medium and long term than would be the case if uh, uh, net immigration was roughly at the kind of levels that we've experienced in the last ten years or so. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. And in terms of a differentiated solution. That could offer opportunities. Oh, the differentiated solution. So uh, there are, um, uh, again, it's almost like taxation. Uh, there are countries where uh, immigration is set centrally. Immigration is set by uh, sub-national governments and national governments in, uh, in consultation. And somewhere, actually, the... Um, the subnational government uh, plays uh, uh, the leading role. Um, there is a very good paper by Christina Boswell, uh, which explores the possibilities for a differentiated uh, uh, migration uh, policy in Scotland. And it doesn't seem to me to be uh, uh, necessarily a huge... One could conceive of policies, and I can go into detail if you like, which do not necessarily threaten the overall target for the UK, but nevertheless allow for some differentiation in Scotland. OK, listen, Alexander's been very patient. <laughs> but, I, I, but there are two people who said they want supplementaries on what Ivan's asked. So can we make these tight, please? Patrick and then Willie. Thank you. Uh, it was just two points I wanted to clarify that I've, that I've understood uh, what's being said properly. The first relates to Murdo's questions about potential longer-term opportunities and the fact that both of your papers uh, and, in fact, all of the other written submissions, so far as I can see, uh, talk about the economic harm of this process and not about uh, potential benefits. Um, is it fair to say, in your view, that even... Uh, the you know a, a hard right, fully signed up Brexiteer with a, a a vision of the sunlit uplands of Empire 2.0 can only really, in terms of the process of leaving, can only really have a rational argument about the scale of the damage that the process of leaving will do, even if they think that there may be further opportunities in the longer term ahead. That that there is is there any plausible scenario in which the leaving the, the taking of this country out of the European Union will not cause economic harm. There's some discussion, been discussion in the newspapers about Singapore on Thames, uh, so that the, the 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 logic the logic of logic of leaving, if you go if the UK was going to go into a low tax, low regulation, low public spend uh, environment. Uh, I would not support that policy, mm. but I understand the logic, the under logic of that logic of that policy. Uh, what, one of the things that I've, I find very striking is that effectively we seem to be delaying delaying uh, the date of exit from the European Union by two years because of, of the transition period, and I think that's going to create its own difficulties in the context that decisions will be taken and the UK will be making contributions to a body which it actually has no representation on. So I can imagine a new wave, new wave of difficulty. But but I don't understand an argument that we leave the European Union, we leave the European Union, and then bind ourselves to basically the same regulations and similar financial contributions that we, that we already make. 
So I think that, that if, if, if I wanted to construct an argument in favour in favour of Brexit, it would be a question of making a complete break with the European social model and the kind of heavily regulated European European economies. I don't see the I don't see the point of actually then having to mirror those mirror those. Uh, re regulatory regimes in, or in order to in order to secure access to markets. Did you want to? Just I, I mean, uh, uh, that kind of transformation uh, it seems to me it's difficult to predict what effect it would have. It would uh, it would require huge structural change in in the in the UK economy. People doing things quite differently, doing different things uh, from what, what they've done before. And uh, uh, I don't think you, you know, the benefits of that can come through in the short to medium term. It would, it would certainly be the long term. I mean, th it seems to me that the, all of the data, or, sorry, all of the research recently on trade patterns shows that it is still the case that ge <coughs> geography matters, that trade, uh, that uh, value chains. Uh, say, are, are really centred in the world around China on the one hand, Germany on the other hand, and the United States on the other hand, and the countries round about them trade with them very extensively. We are moving uh, out of the, the ambit of, of, the, um, of one of the three key trading uh, uh, partnerships in the world. Mm -hmm. the, so the, the second point, just very quickly, uh, just the, the, the you said to, to Ash Denham about the, the divorce bill. Have I understood you correctly that the UK government, if it wants to avoid adding another dose of something toxic to the relationship between itself and the Scottish government, has complete freedom to decide whether it will pay for that divorce bill in a way that avoids a knock-on consequence to the devolved administration's budgets? Yes. Thank you very much. How realistic is it really to, to suggest to people that leaving the single market, paying the divorce bill, means the end of everything and we don't pay a further penny? When you consider that we're kind of inextricably linked to the digital single market in Europe, and there's a huge range of services that we currently share and will continue to share beyond Brexit. It's ridiculous to suggest we'll get that for nothing. You've got roaming charges have been flattened out. Online content will be available right across Europe from next summer. There's general data protection regulations coming in that the UK is signing up to. There's huge amounts of digital infrastructure already in place. It's, isn't it ridiculous to say we'll pay a one-off bill to say cheerio, but continue to use all that? Isn't it a bit like saying we'll be off the bus and on at the same time no, when it comes the, to the digital market? The, to the extent you're picking up what I said, the the the, the point I was my, my personal view is it will be sensible if the UK completes the discharge of its financial obligations to the European Union, so you have a clean break. At that point, you then discuss what future collaborations you're going to have, and, pay for. Uh, and, pay, uh, and almost certainly you've been union will expect the UK to pay for them. But to, but to make it really quite clear, what is what what the divorce bill is, and the, uh, on the day on the day that divorce takes place, there's a clean break. If you want future relationships, uh, for example, contributing into Erasmus or Horizon 2020, that's very important for Scottish universities, that you actually are going to are going to pay for that. So you actually. It's quite transparent in terms of presenting to the public that what the, the, the divorce is over, our future relationship is something we do on a transactional basis. So you think we can be out the single market, but in the digital single market at the same time? Out the single market, in the digital single market? I confess I don't know much about the digital single market. <laughs> I'm sure David Bell is going in late. No, no, I, no I, not really. I, I just think all of these things... Um, will be determined by negotiation whether we're in Horizon 2020 or, or, the, di or the digital market. And, and um, a lot will depend on European politics and whether they particularly want to engage with us or not. And, and, and you know, it's unlikely that, that, um, that it will be a free lunch for us. 
Alexander, you've been very patient, as you said earlier. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, convener. Um, yeah, given the noise of Brexit, I think one of the most incisive points I've seen actually put on paper to date uh, is Professor Hill, one of your conclusions, uh, where you say uh, conflicting forecasts of prosperity or doom align with the individual's view of the desirability of Brexit. I wonder where you put yourselves in that statement. Um, we, as I said at the beginning of my contribution, we, li we live at an age of remarkable uncertainty. Uh, the the um, e e e econo e economic models tend to be calibrated on the basis of past experience. Uh, there's much rhetoric, but people are talking about this being the biggest change in, in Britain's relationship with the outside world since 1945. So, I mean, to some extent, uh, existing, existing data isn't necessarily going to tell you, uh, tell you what's, what's going to happen. One point, one point I, I forgot to make earlier is I'm surprised that we haven't actually talked more about the cost pressures on the, cost pressures on the Scottish budget. Uh, because that does seem to me that one of the, which is partly Brexit related in terms of exchange rate de depreciation, but also related to the issue I raised at the beginning about the long period of long period of austerity. Uh, the, uh, I think one of the reasons why the public sector pay cap may be coming to an end is that there are, apart from the political difficulties uh, that the government experienced at the last election, there is also the fact that recruitment difficulties. Are beginning, are, are beginning to appear that might be accentuated by Brexit by losing access, losing access to the, uh, the European Union workers or becoming less attractive to European Union workers. And one has to think through the kind of, if there was a sudden release of the public sector pay cap, uh, Barnet will not, because the Scottish public sector employees are a higher proportion of the total workforce than, than, than the UK average, Barnet isn't necessarily going to pay for, pay for that. So that you know, a a a a three percent increase across the board uh, on a UK national national agreement will cost Scotland more. So there is there is definitely going to be budget pressures on public spending in the UK, but they they're very much also going to affect Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland to the extent that they have larger public sector workforces. So I think that one of the a, a, a very significant issue is going to be in the context of public sector pay. And Professor Bell? Uh, um, I would hope to think I'm uh, driven by the evidence. Um, and what the, the, um, the uh, um, particular... The, I, I don't claim to be a trade economist, but all of the um, examinations of patterns of trade show that geography matters. Being close to something matters in terms of who you trade with. And if you cut yourself off, well, um, that, that will be an issue. In relation to, in relation to migration, uh, one, it, it's important um, to um, uh, realize that for the foreseeable future, the Migration Advisory Committee will, ha will play a key role in determining whether we, we get more anaesthetists, for example, if they're from outside uh, the UK um, uh, in the future. So if Scotland has got differentiated needs in terms of um, a particular occupations, then it is incumbent on the Scottish Government to make the case to the Migration Advisory Committee that uh, these occupations be placed on that list so that it is more easy to get uh, people from outside uh, the, the uh, UK to, uh, to fill whatever vacancy. Currently it works basically for non-EU migrants, but there is a big debate to be had about its role changing to cover UK, sorry, EU migrants post Brexit. Thank you very much. Okay, folks, we've had a significant session this morning with our two professors. Thanking for thank you for helping us delve a lot deeper into the issues that we're going to face in detail. I think it was extremely useful, um, uh, and I know um, this public this is the public part of the meetings concluded, and I now move the meeting into private session. And thank you very much.